So guys how are you what if Naruto was became god of fire shadow in a new world of justice league movie? Okay, this obviously is not the afterlife, because I sure as hell did not go swimming the last time I was there. Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze commented as he finally got out of the ocean and tried to wipe the obvious salt water from his eyes with both his hands, not that it was going well since his clothing was soaked, he was confused to hell on how he got here of all places, not that it was a bad place since the island was pretty much a paradise at first glance. The former 7th Hokage of Konoha had long since passed on in peace. His son Boruto a high-ranking janin who was now working with the 8th Hokage Konohamaru and married with his own family. And his daughter Himawari, herself a high-ranking janin and also happily married with her own children and her now awakened Byakugan had been there at his funeral alongside his wife Hanada who had also passed on. Thus he had accomplished all of his dreams and goals in life and had gone into the afterlife and had reconnected with those who had passed on like he did, that included his parents, Sasuke, Sakura, Hanada, Jiraiya, Aruka, Hiruzen, and so many others, it was a grand reunion and a chance to finally reconnect, hell he even ran into his mother figure Tsunade there and even Gara as well as the other former cage, it was a wonderful time to see so many old faces even if they were long dead now. It was a good chance to relax after all that had happened. Plus he could chat with Kurama and the others every now and then to hear how things were back in the realm of the living. So far their world did well and much of what they had done to make their world better was retained. And even improved on by their successors, then suddenly. At a certain amount of time, or what passes for time in the spirit world some sort of massive disturbance slammed into the realm of the spirits and it caused quite the ruckus and so he and everyone else did what they could to stop it, however, while he had managed to help seal a rip, another blast of energy happened he got hit by one powerful wave of the same energy and in brief moment he felt like he was being torn apart in multiple directions. And then, he found himself in a bleeding ocean and had to get to the surface as he realized that he was in actual water and not some illusion. It managed to break the surface and take in a very explosive gulp of actual air and took in more oxygen into his body, once he was done with that part he began to summon his chakra and soon got himself out of the water and began to water walk to look around, and he soon spotted from a distance, the island and despite his still lingering confusion on how could possibly be back in the world of the living. Once getting his foot on actual sand and then moving down to hold some of the sand in his hands to make sure that what he was feeling was indeed real, he began to look for any signs that could help give him some idea on where he was, Naruto then decided to try something, which he knew was going to be a pain, no matter how brief, he bit his finger to draw blood, and sure enough, there was pain and soon he saw blood on his hand, and as quickly as that happened, his wound healed quickly. Okay, obviously I am alive otherwise I wouldn't be feeling pain again, and I actually, bled, damn it, what the hell happened? Naruto said as the pain he was feeling faded from being healed quickly, as soon as it faded and he was assured that he was indeed back in the lands of the living yet how was eluding him still, another sensation assaulted him. I am freaking hungry, it was true, having already died. Naruto was no longer affected by hunger though he was able to enjoy the spiritual equivalent of food and drink. Namely from Hinata and his mother Kashina who was more than willing to spoil him rotten. No doubt to make up for all the years she had never been by his side. Hanada certainly did not mind and was actually happy to finally meet Naruto's mother even in the afterlife, and naturally Kashina took a shine to her daughter-in-law, revealing that she had been happy to see a woman who had loved her son so deeply, even when they were kids, much to his embarrassment and Hanada's own, so to suddenly and unexpectedly brought back to life, was enough to drive those hunger pangs back with a vengeance, along with thirst as well. Naruto decided to check himself first and was pleased at least that his now reborn chakra circulatory system was all right and recovering. Though his chakra supplies were no longer as potent as before when he was alive. It made sense to him since his body, how he even had one much less his old body back. Was no doubt recovering from all of this, so far his chakra was around the level when he had tangled with Zabuza and Haku. Not a lot and it would have to do for now, he decided to focus on getting food and water first, and hopefully, find out just where he was, he did not want to use any higher abilities in jutsu just yet, plus he might need to get some energy back before checking to see if Kurama and the other biju were with him, on the off chance he still had his ability to connect to them. Sisters. Look. A number of women wearing simple clothes with armor on top and carrying a fair number of weapons turned to see the plume of smoke coming from a distance, and while they were drop dead gorgeous women, they were hardly delicate as they carried their weapons well as if they were trained well in it, but the sudden presence of smoke where there should be none had them on edge and one spoke out. What could be going on here? There's no one out there on that stretch of the beach at this time of the day. There can only be one thing, intruders, the one turned and spoke. Go warn the others and tell Princess Diana and Queen Hippolyta that we have intruders. Yes sister. 
The Amazons of the Mischira had no love for unwanted guests in their homes, even more so if they happened to be men, how this intruder found their sacred home they had no idea, but they were going to make sure that said individual would not leave it at all if it came to that. Back on the beach, Naruto was pleased to at least have found some food and had clean water right now. As soon as he got his stomach to calm down, he could try and find out if anyone lived on this island. He normally could have reached out with his sage mode or with the power of Karama as well as the others but he had decided not to use them since with the way Ho's body was and his chakra as well, he was not sure that using either method right now was worth the risk, not only that, he was not yet sure if they were with him since he had yet to try and contact them in his mind like he normally did when he was in a meeting with them. He managed to catch some fish and also found good fresh water from coconuts and got his thirst dealt with once he used his wind chakra to create a finely sharpened blade to cut them open to get to said water. He also decided to try some of the coconuts and while he was not really a fan of the stuff, it was nice to have something ease the hunger in his body a bit before going over to the main course, the fish took a bit more effort to catch and prepare but with them now roasting over the fire he had managed to make quickly with some good driftwood that was dry and some fire chakra and was now looking forward to a meal as the fish was cooking well. However his danger senses quickly kicked on and he turned to catch an arrow before it buried itself into his back, he turned and saw several women who were armed and armored unlike what he had seen before coming at him, that was not entirely accurate as they seemed to be armed and armored in the same manner as Temujin's people, but the gear was still unknown to him, Naruto quickly got up and snapped the arrow in half and spoke out. Who are you people? One woman armed with a spear snorted and spoke. You dare ask who we are male? We are the Amazons of the Mischira, and you are trespassing on our land. That comment quickly answered Naruto's previous question on whether the island was inhabited or not. Though he still was confused on why was it he was able to understand the woman as if they were speaking his world's language. It made no sense to him since as far as he knew, after he retired as Hokage and traveled as a sage and ambassador. There was no way he had encountered people like them before. So far the only group he could group his could think of who were similar them right now were the Kunoichi of Nadashiko but he seriously doubted they related to Shizuka's village were since there was no way that the Kunoichi there would set up a new village outside of the land of water, not only that, he had never heard of the Mishira before, it sounded very foreign to him so the only thing that could make sense to him was that he had somehow landed on a foreign island. And obviously they were not happy about it, what? Amazons. I have no idea who you are, and I certainly did not know this island was inhabited. Liar. You came here to plunder our home and no doubt take our sisters as your slaves. Okay. Now that was uncalled for. The anger in the tone of the woman was genuine and the stance told Naruto that the woman in front of her was really on egg in dealing with him. And no doubt would skewer him on sight the very second he did something that she thought was a threat. The same thing was present in the eyes of the other women, not a good thing in the blonde's view and also even more confusing on why they have such an axe to grind against men, granted he understood that there were indeed men who got the ire of women easily, but to suddenly lump him, a man they barely met into the same group as said men without any proof was very much a dangerous thing, but still, he would try to talk some sense into them and hopefully avoid an unneeded fight. Now hold it. I am not your enemy here, but that did not sit well with the women as the first speaker glared. Silence. Die. Well, looks like diplomacy is out the window, time to defend myself and hopefully get some proper answers. Naruto quickly decided that he had to move fast, even though he still had no idea what was going on there was no way in the afterlife he was going to let himself die today. He quickly moved to using the body flicker jutsu and quickly took down the attacking Amazons but non-lethally since he was still confused out of his mind on who they were and he was not going to get any good answers if they all decide to kill him, soon they all dropped down out cold but alive and he faced the one with the bow, quickly grabbing the weapon and snapping the string and tossing it aside. The Amazon was shocked to be sure but Naruto quickly backed away and spoke again. Look. None of your sisters are harmed, I merely knocked them out so can we please try and talk like civilized people? Anything the woman was about to say was cut short when another voice joined them. Who are you and why are you here in my people's home? Naruto turned and saw a drop dead gorgeous raven haired and blue eyed woman who would have easily been up there in the looks department with his wife Hanada. Tsunade even if she was technically older, Mei Terumi, Kuranai, and a few other kunoichi he knew of plus some of the princesses back home even though she wore a style of clothing that did not in any way ring any memory cords. He had no problem seeing how drop dead beautiful her figure was. She was tall, and yet had all the right curves and swells in all the right places. And had muscles too, but not the overtly bulging kind but the kind that belonged to a woman who was well toned and strong. Yet undeniably feminine, still he could tell that she was no slouch in a fight and no doubt well skilled in combat. 
That much he could see as while she seemed to be casually studying him at first glance, she was already sizing him up, wary of any movement he might make that could be seen as a danger to her, and no doubt to her fellow women, she was also carrying herself in a very regal manner, only that of someone who had been raised in a very rich and powerful household, and from the tone was someone high up in the leadership ladder. Possibly a princess, Princess Diana. Yep, nailed it. Naruto was at least pleased to be speaking to someone who was of authority here, though he balanced it with the fact that she too was wary of him, but he could see that there was also a hint of curiosity in her eyes as well, and that was something he might work with in order to decide just what he was going to do next, but for now he had to play the diplomat and hope that she was a more approachable person than the others. Okay, in answer to you question Diana Haim, I am Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, of Konoha in the Land of Fire, former 7th Hokage and head of the Uzumaki clan, and I apologize for being here as I had no idea this was your people's home and I have no desire to fight you or anyone else. Diana arched an eyebrow at that, curious at this sudden turn of events. There was always the chance that the male was lying. As her mother told her to be wary as men can be very deceitful. The princess had arrived to witness him disable her sisters with a move that made her seem to be in par with Hermes. Messenger of the gods, though not at that full level and then attack the last Amazon, but had actually taken her bow and snapped the string, rendering it useless, but had then moved away to try and talk to her. Diana also saw that her fellow Amazons were actually alive and out cold, still he could very well be doing it to make them lower their guard, pry a lie into their ear and stab them in the back. For some reason looking at the blonde male though made her think that while he could be quite capable of such an act, it seemed countering to who he was, she had no idea why that was the case though and her caution won over her thoughts for now and she spoke once more to him. How so? You defeated my sisters with ease apparently, so why not attack me? And what does Haim mean? Okay, this is going a bit better, at least she's not trying to flatten my head in, I might as well try and see if I can at least end this without bloodshed. Naruto thought to himself and hoped that this was going to be in he direction he hoped it would go. Well, for one I did not harm them with lethal intent, merely rendered out cold, they will wake up in a few minutes, and for another I have no prior history with your people though you do remind me of a people I knew of a long time ago, I also don't have any desire to fight unknown people as well, and lastly, Haim is a translation for princess, fitting now that I think about it since you were one your highness. Diana cocked her head to the side seeing that there was no deception at all in his words. Making her all the curious though no less wary, it was clear to her that this was unlike anything she had dealt with and sure enough her fellow Amazons were beginning to wake up. Though they were doing it slowly since how this, man Naruto had hit them seemed to be very precise and accurate to have made them go down that quickly and take this long to recover, now however it begged the question how the male got here, there was no sign of a ship anywhere, either an intact one or a wreck, there was no way this man had been able to swim all the way here since the ocean had it fair share of predators and thus moving in the ocean solely on muscle power was hard to do. How did you come here then? Naruto realized that this was one question he was going to have a hard time answering, after all, how exactly did one explain to another that he had pretty much been a spirit in the afterlife? But seeing as he had no other alternative before him, he might as well try and see how things will turn out if he told Diana his origins. Well, that might be, hard to swallow, you see, I have no idea how I got here, or how exactly I am even alive for that matter. The last place I was in was in the afterlife. Diana was wide eyed at that as she was well aware of what the afterlife was. But among her people, they called that the Elysium Fields, and as far as she was aware, very few ever came back from that place. Psyche was one. Along with the famed musician who charmed Cerberus to sleep with his lyre. But no spirit itself had ever left the place unless they were somehow summoned with sacrifices or were sent up by Hades or summoned by a sorcerer. And the man before them was obviously no spirit. Cerberus would never allow anyone among the dead to leave the land of the dead, there was also the fact that the man before him was no evil man as far as she could sense, once more she counters what she felt with the still lingering possibility that he was deceiving them in some manner, but decides to try some more to see if she could get the truth from him. If not, then he would have to be detained and then subjected to the lasso of truth held by them and since it forced anyone in its grip to speak the truth, then it would help. You, are saying you are from the Elysium Fields? Naruto was surprised at that and for good reason as the afterlife was usually called the pure world, not the Elysium Fields, but if she called it that, then there was the chance that the term she used was her culture's way of calling the afterlife, with that in mind, he might as well roll with it and hope for the best and replied. Uh, if that is what your people the afterlife and I suppose yes I am, but somehow I was brought back to life and came here, believe me I am as confused as you are, so please, can we at least have a civil discussion before anything else? 
Any attempt at the conversation was cut short when another group of Amazons came in armed to the teeth and one of them a woman who would have been easily seen as a member of Kumo came at Naruto with a spear, and she was not alone as a redhead who carried a sword and a shield was also glaring at him with killer intent. Naruto could not help but feel a bit of a sweat drop go down the side of his head at this, this was not good at all. Vile male, you dare to set foot on the Mishira? Die. Naruto was getting really annoyed by this and decided to do something drastic but yet non-lethal as he still needed to prove that he was not here as a threat to them. Crude not again. That's it. Naruto decided to summon the chakra he had in him, which was still quite a lot and soon placed his hands in a cross style that confused the Amazons and Diana in particular and then uttered the words of the technique that made him famous in many a battlefield. Cage Bunshin no Jutsu. To the shocked Amazons including Diana, there were now more men there and all of them looked like the lone male and all of them were growling in annoyance at them and they were soon whispering. Magic? How come they all look like that male? He is a sorcerer. Naruto and his cage bunshin were ready for battle now but the original decided to not attack the people before him and try to reason with them once more, he was not here for a fight with people he had no knowledge of, let alone had no reason to be enemies with, but if they were unwilling to listen to reason then he would fight, possibly to restrain them and if needed use one as a hostage, that he disliked immensely but it was an option just one he hoped he would ever use. Look, this does not have to turn into a battle, I am not here to harm anyone and your sisters are fine, if I am at least allowed to leave in peace then please let that be the case and we can forget this ever happened, but if any of you decide to attack me again, then the kid gloves are coming off. Diana was intrigued indeed, the man was unlike anything she had been told about men. He seemed to have great power and yet did all he could not to cause conflict. That much was clear and apparently while he did look at her and her fellow Amazons like any normal male would he seem not to be driven by baser instincts. His stance was also that of a fighter and yet unknown to her which was confusing as she had been trained by the best in her home and thus was familiar with many a combat stance with only her mother and Artemis knowing more than she did. She also recalled the time he said he was actually from the afterlife and had no idea why he was alive let alone here, there was indeed no deception here and her emphatic senses told her that the young man, or whatever he truly was indeed had no desire to fight them but would fight if pushed too far. She decided to speak and use the laws of her people when it concerned outsiders. Namely those of the male gender, normally male outsiders were either killed if they attacked or if taken alive were then taken as a prisoner and then after a set amount of time would be judged by the Amazon assembly and then executed for trespassing on their lands. Even more so if they attacked or abused any Amazon on the island but a male can actually fight for the right to be allowed to remain on the mischira under watch but will not be harmed by any amazon under the law. Until he either breaks the law in which he will be killed or desires to return home and is affected by a spell to lose all memory of the mischira. It was extraordinarily rare for a man to be made an ally of the amazons and allowed to come and go among them, it was almost unheard of ever since the time Hercules and his thug followers came, after what happened, not one male ever been seen as an ally with the marked exception of male gods who were friends to them and they were few enough as it was, still they might as well give this man a chance. General Philippus, let me speak, your highness. Diana understood the dark-skinned woman's reasons for not being all that keen on what was going on before them, but she was not going to relent as she had made her decision and must see it through. Trust me. The Amazon general looked at her princess and saw that Diana was serious and despite her personal thoughts nodded and soon the princess spoke once more to Naruto, and since he knew that she was looking at him now, he was the one she was speaking to. You showed that you do not desire conflict at all with this Naruto and there seems to be no lie in your words, which in itself is surprising, but as the law states, no man is to be allowed to set foot on the Mishira and thus any are to be dealt with, with violence if it comes to it, and if an Amazon ever brings a male here they Saira, then she is exiled, however. Naruto raised an eyebrow at that and decided to disperse his cage bunshin and listen to this. However, if you defeat one of us in combat, then you will be permitted to stay on the island without incident unless you desire to leave and a spell made by our priestesses will remove your memories of our home, or you break our laws and thus that protection is taken away. Philippus then spoke, but if you lose, then you will be a prisoner until the time comes for you to be executed for trespassing. The blonde was wide-eyed at this, this was reminding him a bit too much of the time he tangled with Shizuka about the idea of her having to fight him to see if he was worthy of being her husband, if he won, then he would be her husband, if he lost, well, he was dead, this on the other hand, while similar was a hell of a lot more different than what he had to deal with when he faced Shizuka. You have got to be kidding me, man, and I thought the old law in Shizuka's village was rather oddball. Naruto sighed at that and replied, there's no other way around this then? Diana shook her head and that made the blonde growl in annoyance as he wished there was some other way. Great. Either I fight to save my life and stay here even if I did not come here to fight, or not fight and be on the chopping block, 
When I find the cause of how I got here I will ask the Kami to fix the mess, or if I possibly find the idiot who messed up the afterlife and sent me here I am shoving a Rasengan right into the colon, damn it. Naruto's deep look of frustration was strange to the Amazon princess since it seemed to her that he was utterly unhappy with being placed in this situation, but it also seemed that he was considering his response to the matter and thus Diana waited until he replied. Very well, may I at least choose my opponent? You may. Naruto was sure this was going to be taken badly if he acted all arrogant about it and decided to be serious when he made his decision, the opponent had to be someone who can be seen as being high up the ladder for better impact, not something one did unless they had cast iron balls or were insane, thankfully Naruto was no stranger to high risk strategies, having done plenty of such things in his day when he was alive. Well, I wish, to fight you Dianaheim, that made Diana raise her eyebrow in surprise but then smiled and she nodded. While the other Amazons were unhappy with the idea of him publicly challenging their princess and commented that he was a very arrogant male to think he could beat their princess. She saw it differently, the man had picked her because she was someone who was high up in their people's leadership ladder since she was admittedly the princess of the island, thus fighting her was not an arrogant move but a calculated one as he had picked one of the strongest fighters among them and also one of the highest among their leadership, not only that, she had seen him when he chose her as his foe, he had taken a lot of consideration on this and was not rushing and out of arrogance. Interesting, this should be an interesting match, one I have no desire to lose, he may be interesting, but he is still a male that I will have to defeat. Very well, I accept your challenge, and if you do defeat me, then you will tell us all your story. Later, the two faced one another in a ring in the city after he allowed himself to be taken prisoner and escorted by the Amazons while Diana decided to move forward and prepare things with her mother. The queen was soon seen and Naruto had to admit that she too was drop dead gorgeous since she had blonde hair. Blue eyes like her daughter and a face and figure to die for. The way she moved and spoke was also of a regal manner along with the items one expected one of royalty to wear. But like her daughter, the queen was a seasoned fighter. That much he had no problem seeing in the way she would calmly and confidently hold the handle of her sword was just as telling. Her stare towards him was also the same but she was also rather curious on who he was. And no doubt had been told of his story by her daughter and was no doubt trying to see if he was lying to them. The golden lasso nearby might have looked like ordinary rope, but Naruto was no fool and doubted that it was there for show, he knew he had only drank water and had limited food and so he might not have a lot of energy and since his, return to the realm of the living, he was now fighting the effects of sleepiness and hunger since he was still adjusting to being alive. Thus he listened to the queen speak on the situation to all the Amazons and also the fight that was to begin between her daughter and Naruto and blessed this match under the name of their patron goddesses to decide how this battle shall end. And so it would begin while the Amazons cheered Diana, none cheered for Naruto and they merely glared at him and said some dispiriting names, reminding the blonde of his past prior to becoming the hero and legend he was prior to his peaceful passing, it did not bother him in the slightest and soon he turned to face the queen who soon gave the command. Begin. Naruto quickly moved on the defensive as Diana came at him and they clashed with one another. Diana had exceptional strength to be sure but not at the same level as Tsunade or Sakura and he was much stronger than he was when he was younger and no doubt being socked by Sakura in their younger days when she was Tsunade's apprentice and him dodging some of Tsunade's own blows toughened him up somewhat. He proved more than able to hold his own which surprised Diana and her sisters and his fighting skills were impressive even though they still saw him as a disgusting male. One of her punches was blocked by Naruto with his left forearm but he moved the fist upwards and then moved close to launch an elbow strike to Diana's midsection. The attack was done at a god pace and Diana managed to avoid the blow by moving backwards but Naruto quickly moved forward and actually moved to using his hands to allow him to flip in mid-air and deliver a punishing axe kick with his left leg, forcing Diana to block with her forearms. Naruto on the other hand could see that Diana's style was very good. Similar to an extent as a fusion of the gentle fist and the strong fist but having none of the potential of both. Her speed was excellent and her healing was good as well. But he was not going to relent at all even if he had to admit that it had been a while since he had faced a good foe in battle. He used that same position he was in while mid-air to place his other foot on Diana's forearms allow him to leap over her. She moved to try and land a kick to him as soon as he landed aiming for his side, only for him to drop to his knees, allowing the kick to sail over his head before lashing out with an uppercut, which she evaded though it was close, she unleashed a palm strike and it managed to hit Naruto but instead of being angered by being hit, he took the blow and then moved to the side with a rising sidekick that struck Diana on the side. Ah. Diana grunted at the blow but she did not stop as she quickly got her footing back and defended herself from Naruto who was using some of the moves he learned from Hanada when they would spar with one another to keep in shape, he did not have the Byakugan, but he certainly had the moves with it counted, however, 
so did Diana as she was able to defend herself well and also unleash attacks right back at Naruto who either evaded them or blocked them. He managed to land a powerful blow when he evaded a series of punches from her and quickly evaded a kick to his side and leapt over her and before she could retaliate, he NLE ashed a double punch and kick combination to send Diana back who recovered and expected him to taunt her when she was on the ground on her knees. But he did not, impressive, the stance and form you use in combat is very interesting indeed Dianaheim. The only styles I know of that have similarities is the gentle fist and strong fist, both of which are powerful in their own right, coupled with your strength and endurance, the style is indeed very effective, you also showed exceptional skill in defense, as well as timing, along with combat awareness, you no doubt would make a powerful kunoichi had you lived in my world when I was still among the living. Diana and the others were surprised, instead of taunting Diana and calling her inferior for no being able to stop him that time around, he praised her skills and fighting ability. Diana herself had been praised before but never by a man and it was, interesting as well as making her feel pleased with herself. I, thank you for your praise, but this is not over yet. I have no doubt of that, the two clashed once more once Diana was on her feet and punches. Kicks, and more were unleashed, and to Diana's amazement and actual joy. Naruto was able to match her blow for blow as she began to enjoy the fight. Naruto likewise was becoming more into the fight as it had been a while since he fought a decent foe and he admired her beauty like any man would if they were in his shoes. Soon she charged using her fist and he countered by flipping over her and landing as she lashed out with a kick which he blocked and then both punched one another hard in the stomach, both of them recovered and continued to fight and what would have been a quick fight in the eyes of the Amazons was now fierce battle that lasted hours, but none of them complained as they had never seen a man go the distance with any one of them, let alone Diana herself. Hippolyta herself looked on at how the two were fighting one another. She could see that the others were amazed as she was. But she also saw the joy Diana had in her eyes and the way she moved showed to the queen that her daughter was actually liking the fact that the man was able to hold his own thus far. She turned to see that Donna herself was surprised that someone like this. Naruto was able to stand against her sister, she saw also that Artemis was focused on the fight while Alexa, the older Amazon's sister was looking on in surprise at how this fight was playing out, the wonder just what was this male's story since the idea of him coming from the Elysium fields was hard to fathom, but she decided to wait and see how this battle will end and then determine with the aid of the lasso and if needed the priestesses to determine the truth on the matter. Both combatants though were focused on another as they continued to land blow after blow. And T seemed that Diana had long since discarded any of her people's distrust towards men and focused on enjoying this battle, Naruto was somewhat in the same boat as she was as there was now doubt that he was now adjusting to fighting against a living breathing opponent and while a part of him admired her as a woman, he also admired her as a warrior and while not a kunoichi like his wife and those he knew back when he was alive, she had exceptional potential. You, fight well. Likewise Dianaheim, soon however, Naruto pulled a powerful combination that knocks Diana out and he is the winner and is bruised greatly as well as Diana was, but he smiled at Diana and to her surprise he somehow summons a form of glowing fire into his hand and then places it on her shoulder, and her injuries fully heal, as soon as he did so, he stood up and helped her up and spoke. Have I accomplished what is needed? Diana nodded. That you have, and you healed me as well, are you sure you are not a sorcerer? Nope, just a really impressive shinobi, now, I think I need to sleep. Naruto soon closed his eyes and began to fall down, much to Diana's surprise and she caught him and she saw that he was indeed exhausted and recalled that he had not eaten or rested ever since he came here, he was still alive and she decided to take him to the healing house and looked at Hippolyta and the blonde queen was more than able to understand her daughter's request and she soon spoke. Let it be known that Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze has proven himself worthy to remain here in the Mischira, and thus is under the protection of our laws. The others agreed and Diana was even more interested in what he had to tell of himself as the man was taken on a stretcher and she accompanied him. To be continued, author's notes. Well, here we are, another idea that had to be made, now on to the reasons on why this came out from my noggin. While I have no plans to abandon Justice League Fire Shadow. I have taken the time to admit that it has a good number of flaws and my presentation of some of Naruto's aspects have been rather, poor in my view, and no doubt in the views of others, I may now be a veteran writer, but I am no saint who cannot make mistakes, I will however finish Fire Shadow, mistakes and all since I have no plans to change my path, I have come too far already and while not everyone likes it, I see enough people who are happy with my work as it is to carry on forward. The little sideshow on the other hand is something I had been inspired to do now that Naruto's story is over in the manga. And while there are a lot of unanswered questions on more than one front, I liked it enough to accept it. Besides, Boruto and Himawari are going to be interesting people to use in any new stories I will cook up when I feel that it is time for Naruto and the whole gang to retire and let the younger generation take over. In this one, 
Naruto has already passed on and is in the afterlife with the others who have already passed on as well, but due to an event which will be central in the coming story, Naruto is torn from the afterlife and deposited in the 600th world. But instead of being in a city like in Fire Shadow, Naruto lands smack dab in the Mischira. And right into the hands of the Amazons and faces against Diana herself in combat, and manages to win even though he is not yet at full strength, and because he has accepted their law and had won the fight against one of their own and their princess at that, then they are by law required to let him stay, how will this affect the Amazons and how will Naruto handle being in a new reality unlike his own? Will he seek to return to the afterlife and find his way back? Or will he embark on a new journey and this time forge a destiny of his own making? Let's find out. Now on the subject of what version this DCAU world. This is still based on the Justice League series which includes Unlimited, but I will be borrowing some elements from the comics, and yes, even from the new 52, only difference is that it is merely to costumes, not the personalities or the backstories of the characters that got revamped, they don't ring well with me since I am more of an old school type, I am also not all that sold on how to approach this in the new 53 format so I am going to focus on the past one. Hippolyta is the blonde version as in the cartoons and in the new 52 but did not have an affair with Zeus so Diana is still the same as in the comics and cartoons. The Amazons are closer to the myths but are unlike the ones in the new 52 and they certainly are not women who claim to be immortal, they are like in the comics, but they do take in female children who they find and raise them and eventually grant them the power to become Amazons themselves but never do anything to male children, Superman is not short-tempered, his adopted folks are alive, well you get the idea. I also plan to add Alexa and Artemis in the mix and even Donna. Now before anyone gets any fancy ideas, let me make it clear that this is still in production phase and while I have already begun to formulate the plans on how this will play out. This is going to be in the icebox for a while, as for pairings, well, not too sure yet since it's still up in the air, I can of course try and resurrect Hanada to make things more interesting but that is not that good an option for me since the circumstances that bring Naruto into this world have yet to be known, and thus we will have Naruto on his own this time though he will be watched over by his people in one way or another. Naruto's power level. Well, he is at maximum power and he is already a former Hokage so all of the things he is able to do at the end of the manga and the movie that deals with him and Hanada. Is there, the fact that all nine biju are here with him and he does have Hashirama's cells in him. And he is able to enter sage mode helps, but to be fair, right now his powers and the biju are very low simply because he had just been brought back from the dead so his new body, even if it's modeled after his original body when he was back to being 19, is not yet retrained in his powers, so he will be recovering his full strength through retraining, though the biju will be sleeping for a bit before they join him in battle. So he won't be chucking out jutsu willy-nilly just yet, but he will at some point. In this time frame, Diana has not yet left the Mishira to one day join the League, in fact it will be some time before she would go to one day meet Superman, Batman, Hawkgirl, Martian Manhunter, Flash, and Green Lantern. The difference here will be that she will not be alone, and how will she act if she has been around Naruto prior to joining the League? Let's find out. This had to be dealt with before anything else since if I did not point out where the pairing will go I will never get any decent sleep. Okay, to be honest, I am leaning to the single bit this time around. Though the harem route is still an interesting option, though to be fair for the readers, I will make it clear to all that if I do go on the H route, I will make some modifications so it won't follow the route that Fire Shadow had taken. That may mean it will be smaller in terms of number or there are some ladies that are off the table for one reason or another, now let's get down to the ladies who are the possible choices in either the H route or the single route shall we? Diana. She's a given and yes, while she will have the look she has in the new 52. She is not her new 52 incarnation, has the same traits and backstory as in the cartoon series but having some comic book elements as well. So don't expect her to be the daughter of Zeus or anything of the sort though she does have some friendly relations, strictly friends, with some of the male gods. Now if she is in the H route, then she would best be described as the alpha female if we use a wolf pack as an analogy. She's the leader of the pack in this case and has the closest relationship with Naruto since he is with her for a while prior to joining the league, so if we have a harem here there will be something of a hierarchy, Naruto however will not show favoritism towards Diana and she knows it as he will be very serious in being open abu at his feelings on the matter and be very much involved in the whole matter. And yes, she will develop the ability to use chakra, though I intend for her not to be the only one among the Amazons. And if she is the only woman in the relationship if I go single, then it would be best described as being like most relationships, though she and Naruto will be mobile in a sense as they would actually have no base of operations unlike most heroes plus Naruto would actually somehow make Diana become a full flesh and blood woman so she can actually have children, and will show the same devotion and love he had with Hinata and their children. One issue though would have to be Io, the Amazon weaponsmith who has a not so secret crush on Diana, 
you can bet Diana having a relationship with Naruto on either front will be an issue for her. Donna. Donna is an alternative for Diana if I decide to have Diana go after our old mister. Tall dark and broody, and it will be just as interesting a situation as Diana and Naruto in this case remain good friends and he stays as her teacher. Donna is one of the few characters who I feel have not yet been properly utilized by most writers. The marked exceptions being Agent G and Giver Genesis, and thus she can be an excellent choice as she had her own personality and she had plenty of potential herself as a romantic partner for Naruto, and if in the H route, she can be the alpha female as well since Naruto will spend a lot of time on the Mizukra before going out into the world and meeting the League and Donna is able to join Diana and Naruto, so instead of one Amazon in the League, we have two. She too will possibly develop the ability to use Chakra as well. Same thing will follow if she and Naruto are a single pairing had it been Naruto and Diana and it will be interesting to say the least, and no, she is not the new 52 incarnation, but the original so leave it at that. Artemis, Amazon, sorry, not going to happen due to her past though Naruto would be more than understanding of her situation, so unless I am convinced otherwise, Artemis is off the table on both fronts. Alexa, Amazon, hmm, potential there since like Diana she is actually a lot more open-minded than the other Amazons. Quite the improvement if you ask me since she has Artemis as her sister, you can bet that if I do the H route and have her in it, Artemis is going to be watching Naruto like a hawk and read to do some serious hurt on him if he breaks her heart, if this happens and I stick to having Diana and not Donna in the H route, they would actually be the closest to Naruto though Diana is still the alpha female of the pack. She too will be able to learn Chakra, though obviously with her nature and her focus as a healer, she could be an Amazonian version of Sakura and Tsunade, minus the temper and history with Naruto though she can be quite the firecracker if riled. Same thing applies for Diana and Donna if it is only Naruto and Alexa in the single pairing run. Cheetah, Barbara and Minerva. Actually, I am leaning to the idea of her becoming friends with Naruto, no not friends with benefits no matter how tempting that might be, and while Cured decides to go back full time as a regular person though in disguise and make her own way in the world. So unless I am convinced otherwise, unlike in the first Fire Shadow story, Cheetah is off the table. Starfire. Coriander. Oh yeah she is going to be in the story for sure, why won't I put her there anyway? She's drop dead gorgeous and to quote a line from a fellow writer who I personally felt had nailed it. She is the care bear of aliens, this is the original Starfire, not the new 52 version who got a lot of flack for her behavior, I will however bring her new 52 costume along with the old one as I did in the first fire shadow since she looks so hot in it, no pun intended, no she won't learn chakra since I think her powers are more than enough though Naruto will train her to improve her arsenal. On the side of the H route, well, she's a Tamaranian so I doubt I need to worry too much on that front and like in Fire Shadow she will be on good terms with the other ladies, most of all Diana if she is there, or Donna if Diana is not in the harem route. On the single route, enough said, Supergirl. Okay, this is a bit tricky on both the harem route and the single route, and for one obviously strong reason, Superman. I mean seriously, the harem idea with Supergirl might work to a certain extent but I am still unsure on how exactly will I have to deal with Superman being annoyed or shocked at the idea of his cousin being part of the whole idea of a harem. Now I am not all that sure on the culture of the Kryptonians namely on the focus on marriage and relationships and the like so that is kind of iffy for me, and I am referring to canon Kryptonian culture, now Supergirl grew up most of her life as a Kryptonian so how she deals with the idea of sharing Naruto if I do use her, but like before it is still up for debate. No, she won't learn chakra, seriously, I doubt she needs any more edges than she already has, though taijutsu would work. Same boat for her if I go for a single pairing, though we can take heart in the fact that Naruto is not going to give Superman grey hairs, at least not yet. Raven. Okay, unlike in Fire Shadow, I may very well have Raven and Naruto in a relationship. And possibly a romantic one Terra is available for Beast Boy so that covers that end. Since Naruto has gained the trust and respect of Kurama and the others then Raven would like to somehow gain that level of control over her powers as well as learn how to trust herself without losing control of her emotions. That would be the crux of the matter that she had to deal with in the long run and she will be a able to deal with this thanks to Naruto though it will be a while, as for the H route if I include Raven, she might not be too keen on it, but since Naruto is among the few to help her without strings attached, she might let it slide or possibly make the most of it. No, she will not use chakra, she has her powers so leave it at that, though she will try to be more creative in their uses. Same with the single relationship route, Ravager, Rose Wilson, yep. Deathstroke's kid, not the new 52 version but the original one who is trying to free herself from her father and making a name for herself. Doing some good and getting into a good scrap along the way. And yeah, she is attractive and downright deadly, and let's face it. 
there is an attractive quality it can bet though that at first she and Naruto won't see eye to eye at first since she might meet him after someone places a hit on him and she gets interested on the job so they meet as enemies. Still he can relate to an extent when it OCMEs to how much she had to endure to be strong, though he is not going to hide his disdain for her father's style of parenting at some extent, on the H root front, she might not be happy with it, but will be willing to deal with it when the time comes. But she sure as well will do all she can to make sure she has her alone time with Naruto. As for the single route, we can always have Deathstroke dare Naruto to a fight to see if he is worthy of Rose, that should be fun. Power Girl. No, not the clone, the Earth 2 version. But I would actually try to use the Aim Kami version of her costume for flavor. I mean seriously, as if the hole there in the chest area was not distracting enough. Still she is the older, more mature, and more experienced version of Supergirl so she may very well have no problems with the H idea if I include her. Plus she is also her own feisty and independent self and Naruto respects that so he knows she can take care of herself, plus she might like hanging out with him since he would see her as a person and not as a sex object, kind of hard to do with how she looks, but hey, who am I to talk? Still only time will tell in this case so it will be fun. Same in the single pairing route though you can bet Naruto will feel like he is hanging out with a much younger, genuinely younger version of Tsunade to some degree. Poison Ivy, Pamela. Oh yeah, she. Essay given since it would be similar to an extent with how they meet and socialize in the original Fire Shadow. Though naturally it will not be in the same manner. Pamela will be surprised for all the same reasons, Naruto is immune to her poisons, and is actually more sympathetic to why she did this and he also tries his best to help her out, she is technically going to be immortal since she is sustained by sunlight and can gain nutrients from the earth as much as getting some from certain food types, plus the fact that Pamela is technically interested in women though may change her stance with Naruto may make her more accepting of the whole H root. But if we go for the single root, well, she is going to mark her territory very well, count on it. Batgirl, Barbara Gordon. No, not sure yet, so until I can be convinced to place her in the running, she is pretty much off the table. Zatanna. Oh yeah, another very NTE resting subject to add to the romance department. She actually would make an excellent addition to the whole thing in either the H route or the single route. And if I recall it right, she is not exactly unused to the idea of being with a man and woman at the same time in the bedroom sense, now I could be wrong here so if anyone can help me in that front I will be grateful, besides, Naruto can have the time to get to know her and it can develop into a relationship given enough time, so yeah, Zatanna is in the whole picture in both the H route and the single route. And please, she is the epitome of a drop dead sexy magical girl or magical woman if there ever was one. Vixen, Mari. Oh yeah. I happen to like her a lot for all the same reasons I am tempted to add her in Fire Shadow at some point before anything else happens to her. My reasons for having her here in either the H root or the single root happen to be the very same reasons I put her there in the story in the first place. Question 2. Does Naruto have a no killing rule? Answer. That's a fairly expected question, and an answer to that. No Naruto does not have a no killing rule, the only difference here is that he will only kill when he has an absolute certainty in him that the villain in question is not redeemable and lives or at great risk, remember that Naruto had times won battles with words as much as fists and after all the events of his life he would still be the kind to try and break the darkness holding people down, the list of people he has changed is pretty well known so I don't need to repeat them. But, and this is vital, there have been people that Naruto has fought with who have earned Naruto's anger and view as irredeemable enemies who have to be killed. And they obviously are Kagaya, Black Zetsu, Madara Uchiha, and potentially Orochimaru and Kabuto. Thus while he will try to redeem some villains, others who have shown no remorse for their actions and have totally become nothing more than darkness personified have better watch out, because they just got lumped into the list of people Naruto would have no problem or remorse killing. He won't like it, but he will do it, question 3. Will anyone else from Naruto's home reality be brought back? Answer. No. At least none of his allies, friends, or family, enemies on the other hand, maybe. No. Kagaya and Black Zetsu are not among them, they are history, dead and gone so don't bother about them, and no, I will not be swayed. Question 4. Will Naruto get back to full power right away? Answer. No. I do plan for him to stay in the Mischira for a year or two years at best, here he can train and recover his full strength before showing up to meet the future league members, Plus it will help him with working alongside Diana and prepare her in a sense for dealing with men, plus it would make things interesting for Naruto being in Paradise Island, so don't expect him to suddenly be at full power in say, two days after his little nap. Question 5. Will there be challenges for Naruto? Answer. Apart from the fact he is alive again. Yes, this is DC ladies and gentlemen, not as flashy as Marvel, but we do have a good number of powerful people, human, non-human, meta-humans, 
magic users, aliens, gods, demigods, and whatnot, so Naruto will be in for a very challenging time, but he will be more than ready to meet them the way he always has. To say that the whole nation of the Amazons was in an uproar would have been like saying the sun was a bit too hot in midday, the outcome of the battle between their princess Diana and the unknown male named Naruto was still hotly debated as some of them were none too sure that Naruto's victory was genuine, still they were willing to wait and find out what exactly was the story behind this man who came to their shores. Not everyone was talking openly about the man right now as they had their chores to do on the island and they had to do those chores now before they could get into this discussion. Amazons by definition were immortal as long as they remained on the Mistura and would age once more if they left it, only returning to the age they had been in when they left the Mistura once they stepped back on her shores, this also meant that unlike most mortal humans they did not need to eat or drink to sustain themselves though they did eat and drink for enjoyment and feasts were grand occasions that had everyone there on the island to meet and speak to one another on various matters. But for now however, the idea of a festival was the last thing on their minds as they were all looking at the direction of the healing house, they wanted answers to who this male was and they were going to get those answers. In the royal palace, Hippolyta was not quite sure how to take the events herself even if she had been there the whole time. Though she did keep in mind that it was well within the tradition of their people, as she looked out to where the young man had been taken she turned back to her daughter Diana who was still surprised at how she had been healed by her opponent, she had no doubt in her mind that the blonde male had thrown some of them into the loop, more so Diana since she had met the man and knew him a bit more than the others who were more content with dealing with him in a more, permanent fashion. Hence the need for her to assign more guards to the place and gave them strict instructions not to try anything themselves on the young man, he was now under their protection and laws and they would not violate the sacred rule of sanctuary for the guest in their house. Are you all right Diana? I am fine mother, still surprised that I was defeated like that, yet even more so since he did not even taunt me. I suppose that is true, still we cannot lower our guard around him. I know, still, do you think that he may indeed be right about him coming from the Elysium fields? I cannot say, I find the story, rather far-fetched, but that is why we will have some of our priestesses and the lasso of truth for us to use and learn the truth of this, tell me, I saw you enjoy that fight, was he that good a fighter? Diana thought about it and after some time nodded. He fights differently from anyone I have seen or sparred with, his style is more acrobatic than most and he is not one to let himself be on the defensive for long, but he is not someone who is reckless, the time I fought him has told me that he is not to be taken lightly by anyone as he quickly launches a counter-attack the second he blocks or evades my attacks, that and he seems to adapt very quickly. But when you met him he had actually tried to be diplomatic and leave the island peacefully. Yes, and when I mentioned the law he was actually quite frustrated with the idea of having to fight one of us to be allowed to stay under watch and then be made to forget our home if he desires to leave. Artemis who arrived and heard all of it, scoffed and spoke. I don't recall him showing that same sentiment in the fight your highness, in fact if I recall and no doubt you did as well, he challenged you to a fight. Diana understood Artemis' reaction and replied, I do not deny that. But he chose to fight me because he knew that I was high in the leadership ladder because he knew that I was a princess and next in line for the throne if anything happens to mother. And we all know from what our history tells us, at times to make a strong case against a warrior society, you have to challenge the strongest of their leadership, I have no doubt had it not been me. He would have challenged our queen had my mother been there, he did not pick to fight me out of ego Artemis, he did it to make his case strong, which means he is less of a brute than most, he actually uses his brain. Artemis frowned a bit but conceded that and Hippolyta continued. That much is clear, there is something odd going here and I have to be certain, this is not the will of the gods or goddesses, but as he has proven himself to us through our laws then we will still hold true with our plans and intents, for now it would be best to watch his progress in his recovery and when that is done, we will use the lasso to make sure that we can gain the truth from him. Donna finally spoke her own thoughts on the matter concerning Naruto. Mother, I have to ask, if we do gain the truth from him, what should we do with him? Hippolyta looked at her daughters, Artemis and then looked out into the city, the idea of a man being here in the Mistura was hard enough for her people as she saw it, still she was curious on who he was and once that was dealt with, then she would have to find a solution. I do not know to be honest Donna, for now though our laws will be on his side until he breaks them, and I will not tolerate anyone trying to force him into breaking those laws, he is our guest and I will not have our home be turned into a battleground for no reason, never again will we stain our homes with blood that is that one one under our protection unless our laws are broken by the one in question, now then, who is watching over the man while he is in the healing house? Artemis was none too pleased by this but replied. My, sister is your highness, in the healing house. Naruto was awake and currently looking into the ceiling before moving his right forearm back to his face, his right forearm and hand to be more precise, looking at the now restored limb, brought back a lot of memories, 
namely when he lost his original arm to Sasuke in combat at the end of the Fourth Shinobi War right after the two of them sealed Kagaya off back into the prison. He flexed his fingers and moved the arm around, still trying to wrap around the fact that it was, flesh and blood again, and the same could be said for him, as he slowly rose up to sit on the bed still looking at his right forearm he wondered just how was it he was alive, and in the moment he began to think on how he lost his original arm. The pain, it was unlike any pain he had felt before, the only thing that came close to the pain he felt right now was when, Sasuke had used the Chidori on his chest. That was how it felt when he lost his right forearm, the pain did not hit him until the end of the battle before he and Sasuke spoke, as he slept, the pain finally hit him yet he was so exhausted that he did not care about it, only when he finally awoke that the agony came, the feeling of still having his arm yet knowing that it was blown apart below the elbow, it was only when Sakura finally came to heal him and Sasuke did the pain finally fade away. As he thought about it and the fact that he was once more alive, the blonde placed his hand down and began to try and piece together what happened, and of course, where to go from here, the feelings he had the day before were not on his mind right now as he had to deal with another feeling, and he could not fully describe it, but the closest thing he could feel that could be able to match this was, emptiness, not emptiness from hunger, thirst, or anything that he used to know. It was, just the feeling that something was taken from him and it was nothing physical, but, spiritual. It took a while before he finally had some idea on what happened to him. The sudden events that happened in the afterlife and how he had been taken from there must have left, a void in him. He had felt at peace in the afterlife, contentment, not contentment from a meal, a drink, being with the woman you love, being with family or even a battle, but honest contentment that was truly impossible to fake, all of which came from living a good long life and making the most of it in every moment and every day, then passing on eventually with no regrets in one's heart and mind. Ever since he finally brought an end to Kagaya with Sasuke and Sakura, and his final battle with Sasuke and their mending of their past and reaffirming their friendship, it was a long roller coaster of memories for him, as he sat there in this unknown house in this utterly alien world, the memories of his time in the living in his world came back to him. All of the memories, the good and the bad and it was hard to see them all over again, and it was not that he did not want them at all. Naruto knew that these memories made him who he was right now and had been the driving force for him to have made it this far, B.U. to suddenly recall all the memories, good and bad, made him feel incomplete, empty, even some of the more potent memories that made his life whole again. Flashback. He looked at the door of his old apartment, reaching out for the knob with his newly restored right forearm and hand, the memories hit him and he stopped. I am home. He always used to say that when he came into his old home, only to be greeted by silence, an empty room, with some leftover ramen cups on the ground, some old books, a picture of his team, and utter silence. He looked at the knob once more and gave a sad look, knowing full well that even with his status, his friends, family, and allies, he was alone in his home, he made peace with that, but it never meant that the pain was gone, or the loneliness that came to opening that door. But as he reached for the knob to get it over with, it opened, he recalled his surprise, and then. Welcome home Naruto-kun. He saw her, Hanada smiling happily and greeting him, he recalled that it had been, at least a month after the battle with Hamura's descendant and their declaration of love to one another while flying back home, she had planned to move in though he had tried to reason with her to let him get them a new place, his old apartment was not the kind of place for them both as it was only for one person, but she refused, and she stayed with him. He looked at her in surprise and she seemed to realize something and began to apologize for taking things too quickly and not waiting for him to say that he was home, he looked at Hanada deeply and saw how much love was there in her face, her eyes, and her smile and he couldn't help himself as he moved to hug her. And Naruto-kun, he listened to her voice and felt her close to him and for the first time he was crying, not tears of pain and loneliness, but happiness. I am home. And he meant it, end of flashback, that memory was very potent to the blonde ninja as he recalled that there were also several memories. The first was him being there to held Hanada's hand as she gave birth to Boruto where Shizune, Tsunade, and Sakura aided in bringing their firstborn son into the world, it was the happiest moment of his life and Hanada's to finally hold his son, and then he recalled how he held her hand when they had him a worry, where Tsunade, Shizune, and Sakura helped bring his beloved daughter into the world. He saw how Hanada smiled while holding their daughter while Boruto was nearby watching his baby sister take her first breaths, he saw the awe at the sight and his son asking him and Hanada if he was that tiny when he was born, much to their amusement, he smiled even more as he remembered him Awari opened her eyes for the first time and gave off her first cry when she saw him, Hanada, and his older brother Boruto. Seeing how happy him Awari was as she ran on the field with Boruto behind her as they were now in the age to be able to move and run. Watching out for his little sister made him smile and he held Hanada close to him as well, not planning to let go of this moment, 
He moved to watch Himawari make a crown of flowers in her hands and the placing it on her head while smiling as the sun hit her face as Boruto was also laughing happily as he chased some flying butterflies, he looked to see Hanada smiling back and enjoying this moment. All those memories, both from his childhood all the way to his married life, and his death took a lot to get used to as they came flooding back into his mind. As the memories rolled through his mind bit by bit, the feeling of emptiness grew even more and he felt the desire to close his mind to the dreams and memories, but no, he would not close them away, they forged him to the person he was before he died peacefully in his sleep, he recalled that moment very well, after all it was at the end of his life. He had come back to Konoha after being there to see to the funerals of some of his closest friends outside of the Land of Fire, and while he had made peace with their passing, he too knew that it was his time, he knew it as he was feeling that he was coming close to his death, but he still decided to come here, he visited all of those who knew him, but not before seeing his son and daughter, and their children and spouses. He spoke to them and made sure to pass on his last words. Played with the little tykes one more time before they were tucked into bed, Himawari and Boruto knew that his time had come and he consoled them telling them that he was not afraid, he lived a fulfilling life and that he had absolute faith in them as their grandparents had faith in him when he saw them again, he also promised to tell their mom how much they had grown and how they would be the ones who would bring a bright future to others and also to their own generation. As soon as he bid them farewell, he moved to look at the place where Tuchi and Ayame had their place and he smiled at how the business had improved and under the control of Ayame's kids, and their own spouses, both had long since passed on and after he paid his respects, he moved to see his old apartment and while it was now inhabited and cleaned up, his room was left as is, per his request, though it was usually cleaned up and kept safe. He planned to give it up once he passed on, but for now he ran his hands on every bit of furniture, every bit of the wall, his old bed, everything, all of that brought back a lot of memories, bad memories when he was growing up, then good ones when he finally made friends, family figures, and more, he looked at the place once more and soon locked it up to move in towards the old training field. He stood there before the logs and soon his memories made him recall how things started out for him, Sasuke, and Sakura, he gave a slight smile as he ran his hands on a particular log in the middle, after some time he moved to the Hokage monument and looked at the faces of the cage long before he took the mantle, and then passed it to Konohamaru when he was ready to be given that position after all he had done. He looked at Hashirama, his spiritual predecessor, Tobameru, the old man Hiruzen, his father Minato, Tsunade, his mother, grandmother figure, Kakashi, his old sensei, and finally, himself, he thought of all he had learned and experienced since he began to reach for his dream of being Hokage and eventually the dream of Jiraiya and Hagamoro, he also thought on his times with Tsunade and Kakashi as well as Konohamaru. He recalled his words to them all, well see one another soon. He then came to the cemetery of Konoha and looked at all of the headstones, all the names of those he knew so long ago, so many names and so many memories, good and bad as he moved through them, touching each headstone recalled all that happened, he soon moved forward until arriving at one in particular. Hanada Hayuga Uzumaki, wife of Naruto Uzumaki, he recalled crying as he placed the small batch of Hanada's favorite flowers on her grave. He also smiled at the memories seeing her tombstone involved in him, all the good times, the bad times, the awkward times, all of it and then he sat down and began to look about, and for a brief moment, he saw all of his friends, and family, allies, and more, he used to have a fear of ghosts and he still did on occasion even at his age, but for once, he was not afraid, how could he be when he looked to see the faces and forms of so many friends? He could feel his life ebbing away and he delved deep into his mind, chatting with Karama and the other biju and bid them farewell with him finally making Karama smile and even shed a tear, something Karama had never done after Hagamoro died, he went back from his mind as he looked at the faces of his generation, all of them and then saw his beloved wife smiling at him nearby sitting on her tomb and he spoke to her. We will see each other soon Hanada Koi, and she, responded with the same loving smile she had for him with a blush as well. I will be waiting Naruto-kun, he smiled and looked at the starry sky, recalling how he used to do that as a kid when he was on his own and then closed his eyes and let his life leave him. And when he opened his eyes, he was in the afterlife, surrounded by those who he knew from so long ago. And now, here he was, and he felt the emptiness again, he felt the desire to go back once more, coming back to life, was never his land, he had lived well, fought well, and made all he had dreamed, what Jiraiya dreamed, what everyone he knew dreamed a reality, and his time was over, and yet, here he was again. Yet he was not on his home, not in his world as it were, but somewhere else that made no sense to him in any way shape and form. But what can I do? How can I, go back? So deep was his thoughts on his situation that he was unable to notice the arrival of the Amazon healer until she spoke to him, Naruto knew that he was not in a dangerous situation right now and managed to resist his battle-honed instincts from attacking her, he knew that doing so would take away any protection he had gained and he was not in the mood to be causing trouble again with the Amazons. 
The Amazon was a redhead, wearing simple robes and having a gentle demeanor about her, she in fact struck him in the same manner as a medic nin or a doctor, in the manner of Shizun, Tsunade, Sakura, Ino, Hanada, and Amaru. He also could tell Hat she was also something of a scholar, he had hanged out with Sakura long enough to see her working on books and whatnot, he could tell that she was capable of combat and was no doubt trained to defend herself if needed. He gave her a smile and greeted her even though to be perfectly honest, he was still reeling from the events that brought him back to the realm of the living and trying to make sense of his feelings of emptiness in him. Ah, uh, hi there. Alexa gave a slight smile, hoping that her nervousness did not show, she was unused to having a man in her care, the last time, well to be honest, there was no last time, no man had ever come to her homeland at all without being dealt with by her sisters in some fashion or another, but now. She looked at him and saw, by Hera, is that, no. I can't jump to conclusions now, I must learn more. She thought all of this quickly but knew that she had to play the part and reveal nothing to the man. And she would be lying to anyone who could see her and speak to her if she said she was alright, she was anything but alright in this current situation she was in, she like her sister had seen what men were able to do and had done to women and while she was not as hostile as her fellow Amazons, she was nevertheless very uneasy about the man being here, even more so when one considered the fact that the man in question had fought her friend Diana and had won that fight. Hello. I see you are awake, are you feeling well? Naruto gave a nod. Aware that despite her calm look and smile the redhead was nervous to be near him, still the fact that she was trying to be nice meant that she was not as angry with men as the others on this island were, if she was like the rest she would be a lot more hostile about it, he decided that he would still show that he was not a threat to her and be friendly, besides she was as far as he could see a gentle sort, ready to defend herself if need be, but not really the kind who did fighting a lot. I am fine, all things considered, my name is Naruto, Naruto Uzumaki, who are you if I may ask? Alexa smiled a bit more, sensing that despite what she had seen earlier. The man was sincere about his greetings and was apparently a friendly person. Therefore she decided to pay that back in kind while observing him carefully and hoping that nothing bad would happen to him while here on the island, unlike her fellow Amazons, including her sister Artemis, yet also excluding Diana, and Donna she did not really have that big a negative history with men and was more open-minded about such things in the same way Diana and Donna were though Donna was not as open as her older sister. My name is Alexa, I am pleased to meet you, Naruto, I must say I have never heard of such a name for a man. Naruto chuckled a bit at that as he recalled just how he got that name and some of the annoyances he got when people used the fishcake meaning more than the maelstrom meaning. Yeah, I suppose it is different, my, godfather gave me that name and my parents, approved of it. The stab of memories and the pain of the loss of being in the afterlife struck Naruto again and he gave a slight frown and had his vision get cloudy again. But he quickly managed to recover from the sudden memories and decided to focus on the here and now. He was unaware that his sudden lapse into his previous feelings and thoughts was seen by Alexa and she was mentally worried what this would mean, but like him she recovered enough and decided to focus on what she came here to do, and that was to see to his medical condition, provide him with food and drink and then take him to be met by their queen and priestesses, but first she had to make sure that what she had seen was not a trick of the eye. I see, well, I have been asked to bring you some food and drink as well as ascertain your medical condition, I have to apologize though since there will be some precautions on our part, as you are, well. What? A man, I understand if you are confused and all but we Amazons have a, less than stellar view towards men. Naruto gave a slight grin and replied, the welcoming group that was there in the beach kind of told me that much already, I want I.E. though. There are indeed men who you have to be wary of and be ready to fight against, and I know that there are men who really do a lot of painful things to women, no worries I have no plans to do anything against you or anyone on the island. Alexa nodded and continued with her work, placing several dishes there, simple but flavorful soup, some warm bread, cooked beef and some fruit, next to it was a glass of water and a pitcher as well, she excused herself and allowed him to eat while she went to the storage room to get some medical gear she needed, along with a special relic. Naruto decided to each and soon he was distracted by both the food and his memories, so distracted in fact that he was not aware that Alexa had used said relic on him, however it was not some form of offensive tool but a scanning device, and what it showed to the Amazon was something she had not expected to see. She decided to carry on after hiding the relic from the blonde male's sight, and once she was done with her work, she decided to go and report his status to Hippolyta and the others, she herself had a lot to ask him but figured that it would all have to wait. Later. Diana and the rest of the Amazons were assembling in the hall to finally see the man. But Diana decided to speak to her mother first to see what the plan was, but her plans to speak took a back seat when she saw that Alexa was with her mother, and the two Amazons were very much deep in discussion on something, no doubt about Naruto since it was Alexa who had gone to the healing house to check on him, as A got closer, she heard Hippolyta speak more seriously, 
making her all the more curious on why this was happening. Are you saying that he is indeed soul sick Alexa? Yes my queen. Diana was curious and listened a bit more, I see, that is indeed a concern, but are you certain of it? I can see no other reason for his state when I found him. He was so wrapped up in his thoughts that he did not respond for what seemed to be. And when he looked back at me, now seeing me, I saw the same expressions in the eyes your highness. And they are at the same depth that those afflicted with the condition have been recorded to suffer. H also reacted the same way when he spoke of his name being given by his godfather and his parents, to be sure I used one of the artifacts we had in the healing house's storage area, and that is the eye of the soul, and the artifact did show that he is indeed afflicted, I may not have much experience in this area, but I have no doubt that the man is indeed afflicted with soul sickness if what I saw and what the artifact showed to me is to be considered. Soul sickness was a rare condition, a very rare condition that only the Amazons knew of it in a sense. This was recorded on their scrolls in the healing house's inner library. And why that was the case was fairly easy to understand, considering how they and all of their elder sisters were created, not merely from earth and clay but from the souls of women and girls who had died in a variety of causes, most died because of the actions of men or the elements, many of the souls who were reborn were pleased to finally be given a new life, away from the ills of the world and from the hands of men who had done them great harm and inflicted sufferings on them aplenty. But there were very rare moments when a reborn Amazon in ancient times would have a huge amount of melancholy. Regret emptiness, and a feeling of despair in being brought back to the realm of the living, their healers at first were confused by this as the Amazons in question were exceedingly healthy until their priestesses discovered that on very rare instances, the souls of women who would form the basis of the Amazon people were women who had been happy in life and had truly lived well before death took them. These souls were able to enter the Elysium fields and live in peace. But then somehow were brought back to life, taken from in a sense paradise for the departed. The result of this was a feeling utter emptiness, anger, betrayal and pain, not of the flesh but the soul, thus the malady was labeled as soul sickness, an artifact given to them by one of the few male gods they were on good terms with, Aesculapius, gave them the said artifact known as the eye of the soul, and said that it would help them see the condition and state of a reborn soul if needed to see if they were afflicted with soul sickness. But because it was so rare it eventually was placed aside as nearly all Amazons after the attack of Hercules and his thugs on their island were glad to be given a new life away from men and the hatred that was with them, and the few who were afflicted with it eventually recovered and made do with their new lives with the artifact stored away, so to know that the man who was here with them now was afflicted by soul sickness was very surprising and telling. Hippolyta nodded at that and considered this new bit of information carefully, it was here that Diana spoke to her to find out what she was thinking. Mother, I take that means that you now believe that he is indeed from the Elysium fields? Hippolyta looked at Diana and replied, while still in thought. True. The eye of the soul is powerful even if it is only used for healing, if the eye senses soul sickness in him, then I am indeed accepting of the fact that he is from the Elysium fields, or rather his people's version of it, you did mention that he was unaware of the term himself, correct Diana? Yes mother, he was confused when I mentioned it after all, why do you think that is the case? I do not know, I can try and ask a petition from Hera and the other gods to see if any soul has indeed left the fields unwillingly to be certain but I have my doubts indeed on it so we must be more careful on our interrogation of him. Alexa was a bit worried about that and Diana noted that from her longtime friend. Is something the matter Alexa? I, feel that we may need to be careful your highness. If this, Naruto is indeed afflicted with soul sickness then reliving the memories may have a dangerous effect on him. The scrolls have stated that some of our sisters in the past who had the sickness had become violent and dangerous because of reliving those memories, we may have helped ease them through it, but this is a man we are talking about. None of us have any first-hand experience on something like this, and I fear that if we are not careful, we may very well make him attack us, I cannot say that he will, but with soul sickness, I cannot be certain. Hippolyta nodded in agreement to that, this was indeed a rare event as no man had not only ever come to the Mistura without them knowing, but no man had ever claimed to have come back from the dead either. I understand your worries Alexa, we will take precautions to be certain, still we must get some answers from this man of his story and see what our next course of action will be, is he well enough to come here? Yes your highness, I will bring him here once I am able to see if he is now at full strength after the meal I gave him and some extra rest. Later, Naruto soon arrived, under escort to be sure and Diana decided it would be best for her to accompany Naruto since she was the one who he would know more than the others at this point, she saw the wariness and some hatred directed at the blonde but noted that instead of either being afraid or angry the young man seemed to merely be curious but calm and utterly unafraid of them all. This made her wonder just what was his story since he was by far one of the few if any man who had ever been allowed to set foot here without being attacked by her fellow Amazons, she looked to see Artemis glaring at Naruto and seeing Naruto see the look, 
instead of being angry or fearful of the wrathful look of the elite guard captain, the blonde seemed to calmly look back but show no mocking looks or anything that would be seen as male superiority and ego even if captured. Her empathy sense told her that he seemed, used to such looks and had long since overcame the normal reaction to such looks. That made her wonder even more since such a level of acceptance was hard to achieve and in such a way as well since there would always be lingering resentment in the hearts of any person man or woman, but her thoughts were placed aside as Naruto was before her mother and she as well as his escorts moved aside as Hippolyta spoke to Naruto while carrying her queen's staff with the owl on top of the staff. Greetings to you Naruto Uzumaki. I am Hippolyta queen of the Amazons of the Mischira. Naruto then gave a warm smile and bowed in open respect and courtesy to Hippolyta. Greetings to you as well Queen Hippolyta, my thanks to you for allowing me to remain here under your laws, I will endeavor to prove myself worthy of the protection given to me and I apologize for any stress or inconvenience my presence has caused you and your people. That surprised many of the Amazons as they had never heard of a man willingly bowing in respect to a woman, Hippolyta was very curious now, and the same applied to Diana and to Donna as well as Artemis and Alexa, but the blonde Amazon queen decided to ask questions for another time as she decided to repay the courtesy in kind and also get down to what was the purpose of this meeting. Thank you for that Naruto Uzumaki, now I trust you have recovered enough? I have, I believe that I did promise to speak about myself you and your people, am I correct to assume that you wish to know my story now? You are correct, are you well enough for this? I am, though I will admit that my story is a long one. Be that as it may, we will be willing to listen. Your claim to have come back to life from the Elysian Fields has caught our interest, since it has happened before in our history, but it has never spoken of a man doing that, I do suspect however that your people have another name for such a place? Yes, we call the pure world your highness, Hippolyta nodded and soon one of the soldiers came forward with a coil of golden rope in her hand. Naruto was curious about that since considering how the soldier carried it. He was highly doubtful it was an ordinary piece of rope, even more so since it seemed to have a faint glow of sorts on it which no ordinary rope should have which made him even more curious and convinced that it was not here for show, the fact it looked like it was made from solid gold also added to the idea that was a, he decided not to ask though since he had a feeling that he would learn of its purpose soon enough. This is the lasso of truth, it has the power to make those caught by it to speak the truth and only the truth, I have no doubt in my mind that you know already why this was brought here in this meeting? You wish to know if my story is the truth or a falsehood? I don't blame you for the caution your highness, from what I was able to understand from my previous meetings, your people don't have any good experiences with men, and thus my presence is something not many here feel comfortable with even though I will state once more that I have no prior history with your people and I have no desire to be your enemy. Hippolyta nodded, at least you were able to see why we are doing this, to make sure that what you tell us is more to the truth, I have asked some of our priestesses to use a spell to allow us to see these memories of yours. That made Naruto frown a bit more. The idea of someone being allowed to see all of his memories was not something he felt all that comfortable with, he was a ninja after all and there were some secrets he preferred to keep to himself, namely more personal memories that he felt no one he did not trust had no business of knowing, he decided to speak his mind and allow them to know his stance on the matter. I see, I can understand that part your highness, as words alone may not be enough to convey my story, but there are memories that are of great importance to me that I will not reveal to you and your sisters, I will not take kindly to those memories being revealed without my consent in this so I hope that you and your priestesses can leave those memories alone. Artemis naturally took offense to that statement and walked over to the blonde with a glare. You presume to order our queen male? Naruto however did not back down and replied calmly. I did not order your queen nor am I showing disrespect to her and in turn your people. There are secrets that are mine and mine alone, and they are precious to me, just as you do not trust me, I do not trust you, trust is a two-sided coin. One has to give trust in order to receive trust to make it work, you have your secrets I have mine, but those secrets will not endanger your people, I only wish them to remain mine until I feel ready to speak of them, if she is willing to grant me this, then it is the first step for me to trust your people. Artemis glared and spoke her mind once more, you have no right to deny what we want, you are not one of the people who call this place home and as such you are suspect until you are proven to not be a threat. Naruto did not flinch at all and replied, so even after I have won my right to stay here under your laws, you would then take away anything you want from me against my desire for it to remain with me. I have broken no laws and I have no desire to cause trouble or harm anyone. I made a simple request to have memories important to me remain mine and they are no danger to you and your people, and instead I am still being threatened. What law have I broken then by requesting this? Artemis was angry at that but then Hippolyta intervened, she knew why Artemis distrusted Naruto or rather men in general, but this was bordering on insubordination, and no ruler can tolerate that when there was no reason to warrant such a response. Enough Artemis. He has indeed earned the right obi here, 
you and everyone here witnessed that happen and I will not have our customs and laws be cast aside, I know the reason why you have your distrust Artemis, but our laws protect him from that. Your Highness, stand down Artemis and calm yourself, that is an order. The redhead sighed and nodded before moving away from Naruto, slowly showing that despite her acceptance of the order she was still not going to let Naruto out of her sight. Hippolyta sighed once more and spoke to Naruto, what sort of memories do you speak of? My personal memories your highness, all of which are dear to me and I will not let anyone looks at them without my consent, besides, I have just come from the afterlife, what dangers can memories from one who has already been in death's realm and from another world that is unlike your own have for your people? Hippolyta thought it over and decided that he had a point. If he is indeed someone who came from another world and had already died. Then his memories were not of their world and thus would have no bearing to her people and homeland, thus she decides to focus only on the vital memories and leave what was private alone. Mo would have ignored this request from the blonde male and take all his memories, but Hippolyta was no such person, she had her own secrets and she knew the value of keeping them close until one was ready to reveal them to the right people. I will agree with what you have asked for, the lasso will tell us after all if you are lying. Naruto nodded and soon was guided to a chair and the priestesses, numbering at least four were on the corners nearby each using a crystal sphere that seemed to be moved slowly with various colors, soon they glowed even more as the priestesses chanted and soon Hippolyta placed the rope on him and he felt the energy coming from the rope into him. Hippolyta then spoke calmly, knowing that once the questioning started, the spheres would reveal the memories of the man for them to see. These spheres shall show your memories to us, at least the memories that you were willing to show, we shall ask questions and the lasso shall compel you to speak truthfully. All right, but I assure you, my story is a long one, all the events that made me into the person I am were placed into motion centuries before I was ever born. Now that got the Amazon's attention and namely Hippolyta's as she could tell from his expression that the man was not lying to her or anyone. They watched the images before them as Hippolyta had the lasso of truth on Naruto and it was now glowing and thus they knew that what they were seeing now with the aid of the priestess was not some fabrication. The blonde Amazon queen began to ask the ninja the history of his world and Naruto replied in kind as the lasso made him speak the truth, and he told them of what he learned in not just his history books, but his tome speaking to Hagamoro and Hamura as well as Hashirama himself, Tobameru and even, Madara when he was in the afterlife. Hippolyta herself was looking carefully at the images before her to make sure that what she saw was indeed from the mind of the man. They saw the images of Naruto's world in the days in the past where countless wars were waged between humans of both genders but none of them had used the powers that Naruto had used before, the Amazons were soon seeing a massive tree, massive to the point it was a mountain and thereon it was a fruit of considerable size, not gigantic, but more than enough to make them realize that anyone who would try to eat would have to spend more than a few hours to finish it. What is this? The Shinju, a tree born centuries before my time, it was also called the God Tree. And what of the fruit I see? Why is that significant? The Shinju fed on the blood and flesh of the many people who fought in countless wars all over the land. With the blood and life it absorbed, the Shinju would bear a fruit that was filled with immense power, it was said long ago that whoever ate the fruit of the Shinju would gain untold powers, to the point that they literally would become a god, but it was considered taboo to eat of it, and many believed it as the origin of the fruit was considered dark and malevolent, so whatever power coming from the consumption of the fruit was deemed too dangerous. I see. The Amazons were silent at this and continued to watch the images as they saw hundreds of warriors who were unknown to them fighting and dying before the tree. Letting their blood and bodies to soak and litter the land and all the while the tree remained utterly uncaring for what transpired around it, Hippolyta then spoke once more, all the while keeping the lasso on Naruto and then making sure to see if that was all, once she had seen enough on what she and the others saw and were satisfied, she decided to continue with her questioning. And what happened next? Naruto then spoke while the lasso glowed to ensure that he spoke the truth at all times as he began to dig once more into his memories of what the past was like in the time of Hagamoro and Hamura's mother. The cycles of war continued until a princess from another land came with the desire to end all wars and bring peace to the land, she felt that only with the power of the Shinju could peace be achieved, her name was Kagaya, Kagaya Otsutsuki. The images shifted to a woman that none of the Amazons had ever seen before. She carried herself indeed as a member of royalty yet she was not human in all forms. Strange horn-like growths were seen on either side of her head going upwards and curling inward giving the impression of ears. Her eyes were pure white and yet there seemed to be something about her that spoke of power, as they watched as she soon moved to the tree and consumed the fruit, in that moment after she had finished consuming the fruit, she literally glowed with power, the very air seemed to crackle and vibrate around this woman and even if it was memories only, Hippolyta was not blind to the power that was radiating from her. What happened to this, Kagaya? Naruto told the Amazons on how with the power she gained from defying the taboo. 
Kagaya single-handedly brought an end to all the wars and conflicts that raged in the land, her power over the elements, space-time, dimensions and even her very own body and life force made her become the epitome of power in his realm's history to the point that she was by all rights a mortal turned into a divine deity, a goddess, the Shinju soon bonded with her and with those powers she indeed became a goddess. The people who she saved called her the rabbit goddess and while some feared that her powers, gained from the Shinju would corrupt her, she resisted it, her compassion, benevolence, trust in humanity's ability for good, and love for life helped her counter the temptations and eventually she had sons, two sons, Hagamoro and Hamura. The sight of the once blood-soaked lands that were sites of so much death by the hands of men, now blooming with life was heartwarming to the Amazons, even more so when they saw her put an end of any pointless bloodshed and suffering. Hippolyta was also pleased to see this before she kept in mind just what Naruto spoke of the taboo in consuming the fruit of the Shinju. What happened to Kagaya after she ruled over your world's lands and people? There was indeed peace as few of the more violent humans would oppose Kagaya's power and over time she was able to make them surrender to her might or to her words. In time however, the lingering fear that the power's dark origins would poison Kagaya finally came to pass, the trust she had with humanity was gradually lost over time as the power she wielded corrupted her, turning her from a loving, benevolent, trusted, and respected ruler, into a corrupt, vile, and brutal tyrant, she went from being the rabbit goddess, to the demon in the times to come as her humanity and her heart was lost in the power that she commanded. She developed a belief that she alone should command chakra itself and that no one can take it from her, and she did so brutally, she placed the humans who once worshipped her and trapped in the infinite Tsukiyomi. What is that? A powerful genjutsu or illusion technique that traps the victims into a realm that is based on their deepest and most treasured hopes and dreams, a heaven as it were, but based on lies and falsehoods, with this she robbed her former allies of their free will, their hopes and dreams, and fed them to the Shinju. Diana was wide-eyed and she was not the only one as the Amazons watched Kagaya who now had a dark and malevolent aura about her feed the people she entrapped into the genjutsu, as it was called to the tree. They watched as the roots of the tree took their victims and then cover them in cocoons and there they saw them being trapped in their dreams and their life being fed into the tree, they all watched in horror as some of the people, men, women and even children as well as even toddlers of any age were being transformed nto, things that looked human but were not. By Hera, what are those things? Naruto responded while still in the grip of the lasso, thus none of the Amazons could say that he was lying. They are called white zetsu, this is the fate of those people trapped in the Shinju and in the infinite Tsukiyomi. They are nothing now but living weapons to defend the Shinju, and served as Kagaya's personal army forever serving her will, those she released from the Genjutsu were utterly horrified of her powers now and thus, she who once helped save humanity in my world had now become their greatest tyrant and most feared and reviled being, she also used pieces of the Shinju to create living beasts of destruction to further reinforce her rule and silence any dissenters. In a sense, this shows that evil does not discriminate in terms of gender, men and women can cause great harm and commit great horror and evil. Kagaya is living proof of that, but her greatest sin came not merely from her actions on the people, but on her own sons. Some Amazons privately wished to deny such a claim. Others were feeling a bit more vocal about that, but since they knew that the lasso made Naruto speak only the truth, then they could not deny it at all. Diana was also very worried by what they were seeing as the Shinju took the life force of people and turning them into beings she had not yet seen before. They resembled the zombies that at times wandered into their land from He Gate of Tartarus but these, were sentient and able to move and fight if need be. He explained that when Hagamoro and Hamura displayed chakra for the first time, Kagaya was filled with love for her sons as any mother would, but this love was tainted by fear and hatred, fear for the fact that they may use their powers to undermine her rule over the people, and hatred for the fact that they had chakra which was in her now corrupted mind rightfully her own, but that love she had in her heart prevented her from slaying her sons when they were still children. But over time when Hagamoro and Hamura displayed new powers, with the elder showing the Rinnegan, and the younger showing the Byakugan, as well as Hagamoro teaching humanity how to connect to one another using chakra, that love was lost, driven by her anger, fear, and hatred, any maternal feelings that still lingered in Kagaya's heart were drowned out and soon she made her move. They watched as Kagaya secretly fused herself with the Shinju and became a truly powerful monster, this was all from the memories of his time speaking with Hagamoro both when he was alive and when they met one another in the realm of spirits. Hagamoro and Hamura now saw that the mother who they loved and respected had utterly lost herself to madness and greed. Her desire to wield chakra as her own had now taken all sense of compassion from her and her desires for her power overshadowed any love she once had for them and for humanity as a whole, they saw that she would willingly do all she could to reclaim what she felt was rightfully hers, even if it meant killing them and all others as well as the hope of the people who she once aided thus to save humanity and end the sins of their mother both brothers fought her and sealed her. 
The Amazons watched the titanic battle between the now transformed Kagaya and her sons Hagamoro and Hamura who despite knowing the face their mother in combat. Did so to end her tyranny, the battle waged between them was indeed fierce and brutal as the land was torn asunder and the skies were blacked and winds howled all over the land. It was in a sense like watching the story of how Zeus and the gods fought with Kronos and the Titans all those centuries ago, and this was similar though it was a mother against her sons who had defied her to save the lives of the people who had once worshipped their parent but now lived in abject fear of her, they had to defeat her vast army of white Zetsu before facing her. Soon they witnessed Kagaya's defeat and sealing by both Hagamoro and Hamura and how with his brother's help, Hagamoro sealed the power of his mother's monstrous form into himself while creating the moon and taking his mother's now powerless corpse, the ghetto statue as Naruto described it and Hamura taking it to secure it and also watch over it and humanity, Hagamoro would remain and hopefully begin the process of undoing the damage their mother inflicted on the world in her madness. Naruto stopped for a brief moment and the Amazons took the time to digest this until Hippolyta nodded for the priestesses to continue, Naruto sighed and carried on once the lasso glowed once more as his memories were accessed again. With Kagaya's defeat and her being sealed away in the moon of my world, Hagamoro went to work in trying to teach a new path for people, because of his own powers, he understood the nature of chakra and created a set of beliefs and teachings to allow people to tap into their chakra and reach out to others in order to understand one another beyond the veil of words. He called it the Ninshu or the Shinobi sect, whereby allowing one's chakra to branch out to others. One gains a greater sense of understanding and community with one another, because of what he had done as his brother had kept himself hidden in the moon and no one aware of the true origins of the ten-tailed beast, he was deified into a living god and known as the savior of the world, with the Rinnegan, his own vast power, and the powers taken from the Shinju, Kagaya, Hagamoro lived up to that ideal for a very long time and earned another title for his deed, Jinchuriki. That word confused the Amazons and Alexa, very curious herself though still reeling from what she had seen asked. What is this, J. Jinchuriki you speak of? It means human sacrifice, by sealing the powers of the Shinju's transformed ten-tailed beast state in the eyes of those who had survived to see the battle, Hagamoro became the living prison and the jailer of the Shinju's vast power, the ultimate sacrifice in the sense for anyone to make as such a choice or burden is not one taken lightly, though in time, that title too would change. Hippolyta took that into account as well and told Naruto to carry on, they would get their answers soon enough, but already this was a lot to take in for them. The idea of a person being used as a living prison for a being of immense power sounded like demonic possession, yet this, Hagamoro was willing to do so in order to ensure that the power would not find any easy means of escape. The images changed to show Hagamoro training two young men as Naruto continued from what he had learned in his time in the spirit world when he spoke to the sage. But even he knew that he was mortal and he knew that in order for the dream of peace and the path of Ninshu to made, he would need to have to pass his teachings to a successor. He also knew that he would face many trials in order to heal the world from any remains of his mother's now corrupted legacy, one such legacy would one day come to ruin it all. Diana was worried by this and decided to venture a question. What legacy is that? Her will given form, even though she had been stripped of her power and sealed in the moon, she was able to hide a piece of herself, and in time, it would be the hidden source of misery and pain for a long time to come. The queen wanted to know just what was going on and what this dark legacy was, but decided that for now that can wait until a better time presented itself, she was curious on just what happened afterwards and she had no doubt the others were as well. What happened to Hagamoro and who was his successor? The queen and her fellow Amazons got their answer as the images showed Hagamoro training two young men in what appeared to be an open field with a banner in the background, both young men however lacked the features that made Hagamoro, Kagaya, and Hamura stand out among humans, as they were very much human in face and form. Hagamoro eventually found a wife and had two children of his own, Indra, and Asura, they would be his legacy to the world as well as a potential successor. Naruto then explained what he was told of both the soul incarnations of the two famed sons of the Sage of the Six Paths while showing them the images of the two both in their youth and in their early adulthood. Indra was the eldest and in many ways the ideal son. Even in his youth Indra's power and physical prowess were exceptional. He inherited his father's potent charka, a special set of eyes known as the Sharingan based on the Rinne Sharingan that his grandmother once had. And spirit, all of this power and ability allowed him to learn and master many arts in his time. One such achievement was to create a battle avatar made entirely from chakra that had power comparable to his grandmother Kagaya, Indra's battle prowess was such that he alone could face off two armies if not more and win in combat, this however made him prefer to be by himself and while some were drawn to him for one reason or another, he shunned others, despite this, he was seen as the ideal son and the possible inheritor to his father's legacy. Asura was the exact opposite of his brother, he had zero talent and power and many felt that despite being the son of the sage he was a failure. 
But this did not deter Asura as he never hated or loathed his brother and father and sought his own path to power. Unlike Indra who shunned others, Asura sought allies and friends, as well as developing a strong training regime and work ethic in himself, with the support of his allies, friends, and followers as well as the same training regime and work ethic. Asura soon unleashed his one power, inheriting the body, vitality, chakra, and life force of his father, more than ample power to finally leave the shadow of his brother and stand side by side with him. And Naruto's words proved to be very accurate as the two brothers who had once been different in terms of power and ability were now standing side by side. Naruto then explained that over the next few years, Hagamoro felt his death coming and over time called both his sons to him and asked them a simple but profound question, a question that would shape the future of the world as many others from other groups of people began to use his teachings to unlock chakra. What is the means to achieve peace? Indra answered. Power, Asura replied. Love. This confused the Amazons a bit more and soon they got their answer as Naruto explained that in terms of belief. Indra believed that peace can be achieved through the use of power. Or in this case the sword to show that the one who had the greatest level of power could put an end to war and be the one to defend the peace from all who sought to break it, something that the Amazons found repulsive in a sense, as for Asura, because he had seen the value of working with others and also the value of people, he believed that through diplomacy and understanding, peace can be achieved, and not by one person, but by all. This belief had a strong appeal to the father of Indra and Asura as he felt that perhaps his younger son had indeed found an answer that could release many possibilities. And it made him find a new solution concerning his own worries about the power of the Shinju and his mother, he was well aware that as it was if he died, then the power of his mother would be unleashed again to cause great destruction and hatred. Asura's beliefs soon made Hagamoro try a new plan, but first he named Asura his successor. The Amazons murmured with one another at such a choice until Donna spoke. How? How did Indra react? Naruto sighed a bit and replied. Indra was understandably furious at this and vowed that he was not going to allow this to stand, much to the dismay of Asura for Asura loved and respected his brother and his father. Thus he tried his best to mend fences with Indra, but Indra refused to listen and soon this would be the beginning of a centuries-long blood feud. As for Hagamoro, despite his own feelings of failing his sons as he had hoped that Indra would follow Asura, focused on the next part of his plan that had been inspired by Asura and of an old prophecy that he knew would come to pass in the future, using his mastery of the yin and yang aspect of chakra he separated the chakra of the Shinju into nine living beings of power and gave them form, intelligence, and sentience, from this action were born the Biju. Biju. The tailed beasts in my world's tongue, they were in essence the sons and daughters of Hagamoro as two of them were female, they were Shukaku the one-tailed sand raccoon, Matabi the two-tailed firecat, Isobu the three-tailed armored turtle, Sun Goku, the four-tailed ape sage, Kuko, the five-tailed dolphin horse, Saiken the six-tailed slug, Chome the seven-tailed stag beetle, Gyuki the eight-tailed bull octopus, and Kurama, the night-tailed fox. The images showed the nine biju while they were still very much infants. But even at such a tender age, they were massive in the eyes of the Amazons. All of them were literally as big as some of the structures in the Mischira, and considering that they were indeed infants, the Amazons wondered just what they would be like at their full physical maturity, they heard the words that Hagamoro spoke to them and to their surprise, some of the biju were saddened and the one known as Kurama was the most affected as the massive fox pup shed tears at the news that the sage would die. Naruto then revealed the growing animosity between Asura and Indra, though it was more on Indra's side than Asura's, soon as their father finally passed on and the nine biju were freed and roamed the world, Asura and Indra fought one another. The sight of the two siblings using their respective battle avatars against one another made the Amazons look on in shock and silence as Naruto continued his tale. Indra, despite his lone wolf nature eventually found a wife and soon had descendants of his own, the two siblings continued their war until in the end, they would die by each other's hands, this soon led their descendants to continue the blood feud even though they would never know the reason for the fighting. Eventually the teachings of Hagamoro would change, and not in the way that he had envisioned them to be. People used his teachings to tap their own chakra internally and weaponize it, in turn this gave rise to the militant version of Niyunshu, which was ninjutsu, instead of using chakra in a way to achieve peace as he wanted for them, the people turned chakra into a weapon of war, the very same thing Kagaya had done. And in turn, the descendants of Asura and Indra would form clans of their own, the Senju and the Uchiha. The audience watched the images play out as Naruto recounted what he was able to learn and see when he had been in the spirit world when it came to the events in history. In his case he was now focused on the clans that would shape the destiny of the worlds he was once alive in. He told them how different the Senju were from the Uchiha. In which the Senju were known as the clan with a thousand skills due to their very broad understanding of the various aspects of the now existing ninjutsu teachings, 
as well as the use of genjutsu, taijutsu and more, on the other side of the spectrum, the clan were all battle specialists who were focused on their own chosen fields and the use of the Sharingan to not only have exceptional vision abilities, but also copy the techniques of their foes and use them as well. Thus it was seen why many would be very wary in fighting Uchiha ninja, and there they saw that the divide between the clans was also on the matter of their respective philosophy, for the Senju believed in the will of fire while the Uchiha embraced the curse of hatred and in many ways the Uchiha were called a cursed clan, it was when Naruto explained the nature of awakening the Sharingan that got the attention of the Amazons. Diana, Donna, Hippolyta, as well as Artemis and Alexa could not help but shiver in disgust at the idea on how the Sharingan grew in power, namely the next stage, the idea of murdering your best friend, blood sibling or witnessing the death of your best friend or sibling was disturbing enough, but, to take the eyes of your sibling who himself or herself had the Megankyo Sharingan so your own set of the same awakened Sharingan could not render you blind, was utterly disgusting to them. By the goddess, to murder your own brother or closest friend for power, I know that such things can happen, but to see this for myself, they are indeed a cursed clan, powerful to be sure, but cursed either way because of how they awakened their gift as it were. They watched the Senju and Uchiha wage war with one another and it was clear that while none of them knew the true reason for this blood feud, they were too far down the line of warfare and hatred to change, Naruto explained how the clan rivalry would extend to even their contracts, when one side in a conflicted hired the Senju, the other hired the Uchiha, and vice versa. It was not long however that things would change somewhat for the two clans as two scions were born among them, from the Senju came Hashirama Senju, and from the Uchiha, Madara Uchiha and these two in Naruto's words would change the ninja world once again just as Hagamoro and Hamura, and Hagamoro's sons Asura and Indra would. How would these two change your world exactly? Donna asked, and she got her answer. Naruto explained through his conversations with Hashirama how he and Madara met accidentally as children and became friends and rivals, the memories that the first Hokage showed Naruto were played before him and he could see prior to his fall and full corruption hat Madara was indeed different, they trained together and became close friends to the point they were like brothers, even though in truth they were by history meant to be enemies. Here the Amazons would learn of the events that would one day form the system of the hidden villages. But in time, both Hashirama and Madara would learn of the truth as their siblings. Izuna for Madara, and Tobarama for Hashirama had seen them and recognized the other, a trap was planned on both sides, but in line with their friendship and shared ideals in their youth, both refused to go along with the plan, they warned one another in the same game they played before and soon tried to leave, but fate had to her plans as their blood siblings and fathers fought one another, and when an attempt to strike at Izuna was made, Madara moved into action. Madara lost several brothers already and so losing his only remaining sibling was not an option, with that Madara saved his sibling and despite retaining his friendship with Hashirama, now vowed to fight the Senju as he looked at them with a fully awakened Sharingan much to his siblings delight and his father's approval. Over the next few images, the Amazons watched as the two former friends clashed with one another and both grew stronger with each major encounter. Though it was clear that Hashirama did not wish this to be the case, Madara on the other hand embraced the curse of hatred that drove his clan and eventually with competition with his sibling both awakened the Megankyo Sharingan, thus as they were now far older and stronger. Hashirama and Madara would eventually rise to the leadership role of their respective clans and both rose to being highly respected and eared in equal measure. Sadly the blood wars between them took their toll on both clans and even among the battle hardened and experienced Uchiha. They had grown tired of war, some even defecting to the Senju, while some Senju themselves wanted an end to this war, everything came to head however when Madara, becoming blind from using the Megankyo watched as his brother Izuna was critically wounded by Tobarama in combat, Despite Hashirama's pleas for this to end, Madara refused, racked with grief at the loss of his last sibling. Soon he returned, saying that Izuna had died and offered his eyes to him to never let the Uchiha fall under the Senju and deny all offers of peace. Thus they fought once more, and Madara lost, Hashirama had enough and asked once more peace between him and Madara, only for the latter to demand that either Hashirama die or Tobarama be slain for he had already lost his brother and his former friend had not. Tobarama called him insane but Hashirama was willing to accept that and told his clan that he will do this and they in turn swear to him on his grave to put an end to the bloodshed between them and the Uchiha. But in the end, Madara, recovering in a sense his ties of friendship with Hashirama stopped him from taking his own life, and in the end, the two clans ended their war, and soon they enacted the things they spoke of in their youth, the establishment of an academy educational system to teach others to ensure that no more children had to die in pointless wars, as for matter the establishment of rules and a system of leadership and governance to ensure that lives were not wasted. Naruto then spoke, and thus was the system of the hidden villages were born, and in it came the very first hidden village, my home, Konohagakure, or the village of the hidden leaf, 
and the first Hokage or fire shadow in your tongue was Hashirama. It seemed like it was the end, but in a sense it was not as the images played on. Despite the fact that both Madara and Hashirama had mended fences for a time, the hidden issues between the Senju and the Uchiha were not fully resolved and Madara's fear of the Uchiha being oppressed by Tobirama when he became the leader of Konoha or the Hokage grew until he decided to leave and rally his clan once more, despite Hashirama's attempts to have the Senju and the other clans who joined them change their stance, sadly many of the Uchiha refused Madara's summons feeling that he would lead them to ruin and death again. Madara did not this deter him however as he had plans of his own having located an ancient stone tablet secretly highlighting the past of the sage and soon a plan formed in his mind, but to do that, he would have to return to the darkness and he did without any hesitation and when he returned, he revealed to Konoha that he had gained control of none other than a massive Karama who was now controlled by the Sharingan. That surprised many of the Amazons as they had no idea that the man had the power to control such a massive being. Naruto then explained to them that over time many sought the power of the Biju, but hardly for peaceful purposes. Seeing them all as merely tools of war and raving beasts with no true sentience and intelligence as well as emotions, thus this bred a great deal of hatred, resentment, and worse in the Biju, and none more so than Karama for he was the strongest of all of them, some were even infused into human beings, becoming Jinchuriki like Hagamoro but no longer as living prisons, but living weapons. The battle that occurred between Hashirama and Madara was titanic, in a way, even though they could bleed and feel pain like normal men, it was like watching gods fight as neither ninja held back, Hashirama however focused on Kurama first as despite his natural edge over the Biju, he deemed Kurama far too powerful to be left in the hands of anyone, and coming from someone as powerful as Hashirama, it gave the Amazons a measure of just how powerful this being was. At great cost to himself, Hashirama subdued and freed Kurama from Madara's grip, this in turn allowed a beautiful woman with blood red hair and wearing regal but functional clothing to somehow seal Kurama's vast power into herself, literally sealing the massive being into her form and surviving much to wide-eyed astonishment of the Amazons as Philippus spoke having remained silent for some time ever since Naruto began his story finally spoke. H. How? Who is she? Naruto sighed a bit and replied, this was one train of conversation he knew was going to be an interesting one. She is Mito, Mito Uzumaki of the Uzumaki clan, my maternal ancestor. That got attention as Hippolyta and the others let Naruto continue. I never knew her or the extent of her power for she was before my time. But the very fact she had the ability to TAE in all of Karama's vast power into herself and not die. Speaks volumes of her power, she never used Karama's powers herself but she was formidable. As Kagaya was the ancestor of both the Senju and the Uchiha. She was ancestor to several other clans, Thins in turn includes my maternal clan. The Uzumaki were known for their unique chakra signatures. Vitality, stamina, and life force, they were very capable in all the ninja arts BU. Their greatest trait was their expertise in sealing techniques or fuinjutsu. Because the Senju and the Uzumaki were long standing allies and friends for generations, it was natural that at some point Mito and Hashirama would meet, and over time, both fell in love and marry. Mito accompanied Hashirama in this battle, and for her love of her family and clan on both sides, and to her husband, Mito willingly became Karama's Jinchuriki. With Kurama out of the way the final battle began with the two former friends who held nothing back and in the end, Madara was slain and the place where the two fought, utterly changed was called the Valley of the End, sadly, Madara's plan was not to defeat Hashirama and end him, not yet, but to acquire a piece of his flesh and blood as well as his chakra, the Madara slain was but a clone, a very potent one and the real Madara escaped. Using the flesh he took from his friend, he began to prepare the infinite Tsukiyomi plan to finally enact what he wanted. Not merely to surpass his former friend and rival, but to finally bring an end to war and strife his way. It would take years but he was not going to stop and soon with hard work and study as well as infusing the flesh of Hashirama into his own wound, Madara merged the blood of Uchiha and Senju, awakening the Rinnegan, and with his power and extending his life force, Madara returned the ghetto statue back to the world and awakening its will, Black Zetsu, with the aid of this being and his growing use of the White Zetsu that followed him, Madara's plans took shape. And soon as the years passed as the first, and second shinobi wars began as Konoha was now joined four major hidden villages who adopted their own versions of the system founded by Hashirama and Madara. The villages in question were Kumogakure or the village of the hidden cloud, Iwagakure or the village of the hidden rock, Sanagakure or the village of the hidden sand, and Kiragakure, or the village of the hidden mist, and from them came their leaders, the Reikage for Kumo, the Suchikage for Iwa, Keisukage for Suna, and Mizukage for Kiri. Madara did not reveal himself often but had placed the seeds of his plans by locating Nagato, one of the few surviving Uzumaki clan members, 
This confused and worried some of the Amazons as Alexa voiced that concern. Why is it that you said this youth is one of the few surviving members of your clan? As far as I know, my clan the Uzumaki had developed a powerful reputation in the ninja world, but not all of it was good, eventually those who feared my clan's skills and abilities eventually waged war against them and invaded their home, the Uzumaki were deadly in their own right, and their home, had naturally occurring whirlpools that acted as a natural defense, but in the end the combined shinobi army managed to overcome them and kill many of my clan, only a few would be left alive. Hippolyta nodded a bit, understanding hat this implied. It was quite possible that one of Naruto's parents was one such survivor apart from this Nagato. Otherwise he would not be alive today, they watched as Madara would use Nagato as the bearer of his own eyes that now had the Rinnegan until he time came for him to be brought back into the realm of the living, in the background of the wars, Madara soon located next key of his plan, a young man by the name of Obito Uchiha, a young Uchiha youth who was the teammate of Naruto's future sensei Kakashi Hitaki and fellow Konoha Kunoichi Rin and Naruto's father Minato Namikaze. Madara interfered when Obito and his team had been caught in a battle that cost Kakashi his eye and Obito half his body when a boulder crushed him. He insisted Rin to give his Sharingan now unlocked to Kakashi to help him and replace his lost eye, on the collapse of the floor below him Obito would be found by Madara and there he would be saved, but not for any other purpose than for Madara to convert his fellow clansmen to his dark cause, and while he gave Obito a prosthetic body to replace the half he lost, he had planned a move that would finally bring his obstinate kinsman to his side. He secretly had several white Zetsu to disguise themselves as Kiri Ninja and kidnap Rin and infuse her with Isobu and release her into Konoha to cause a massive rampage. He allowed the information to reach Obito who had gained mid-level mastery over the powers given to him and as he expected, Obito rushed there to save his friends, unaware that he was walking into a well-orchestrated trap, Obito arrived in time as Madara hoped, to see Rin being pierced in the chest via Kakashi's rakery, unaware that prior to his arrival Rin had realized what had been going on and had told Kakashi to kill her in order to prevent Isobu's rampage in Konoha. Kakashi refused unwilling to kill his only remaining team member and knowing that she loved him despite Obito showing that same affection to her while he did not. He promised Obito he would not let Rin die, but the Kiri ninja attacked and forced him to fight, Rin however aware of Kakashi's thoughts and unwilling to let Konoha be destroyed on account of her willingly stepped into the path of the rakery right in front of Kakashi, this allowed Kakashi to awaken the Megankyo Sharingan, and sadly Obito's own as well. Obito went utterly mad with anger, and grief at this and attacked the Kiri ninja though not killing Kakashi who had fallen unconscious, he held Rin and cried at the inability he had to come to help her in time and left hiding his presence once more and for now embracing the clan's curse of hatred, hating the world that they lived in, this however played into Madara's hands and Obito never knew that the whole time that his ancestor was the one who truly killed Rin. As Madara passed on, Obito, now more than able to hold his own worked in the shadows to finish the plan he and Madara began. He started by seeking out Nagato who did not need much convincing as he had recently lost his friend Yahiko to the machinations of Danzo. The leader of Konoha's Anbu root unit, a faction that Hiruzen had done his best to stamp out when he became Hokage. Thus he, Nagato, and Konan along with their allies in Omegakure killed Hanzo and all of his allies, friends, even family as Obito secretly twisted the young Uzumaki think that pain is enlightenment and that only when the world's people knew true pain would there be peace, the seeds had been sown into him the day his parents were mistakenly slain by Konoha Ninja and where the Rinnegan would awaken, leading to Nagato hating Konoha. Obito eventually made his way back to Konoha, no longer seeing the place as his home. He eventually found Kakashi talking to Rin's grave and learning of the birthing of Naruto himself from the young Jonin who was unaware that his formerly deceased friend had returned. Opshio learned of the location and quickly moved it, killing the Anbu and then the Kunoichi midwife and Hiruzen's own wife Bawako taking the crying baby Naruto hostage as Minato and Kashina were caught off guard, even more so as the seal holding Kurama had loosened. It was here that they would meet Kashina Uzumaki and Hippolyta saw a loving and proud smile on Naruto's face. She is your mother then? Yes, I may have inherited my blonde hair and eyes from my father but everything else, including my personality I got from my mother. There was no doubt that Naruto held his mother in high regard. Something that was interesting to Hippolyta and also to Diana as well as Donna. The blonde queen looked at Kashina carefully to make sure she did not miss any details. She was indeed rather attractive in many ways, her hair was blood red, a far deeper shade than any of the other Amazons with red hair, including Artemis and Alexa, her eyes were deep violet and no doubt held a great deal of power as well, she may have recovered from giving birth to her son, but the look in Kashina's eyes showed that despite the pain of childbirth she was more focused on the safety of her family, not herself. A true mother in every sense of the word, 
and Hippolyta wanted to know more but decided to ask at a later date, after all, she wanted to know how was it that Naruto had these memories in him as he was merely a baby at this time. They watched as Obito, his identity hidden from his former sensei and his sensei's wife, threatened the young Naruto with a kanai to the throat and soon the seal broke and Kurama was breaking free. Minato could not help his wife at this and had to save their son, and he did so with an interesting display of prowess. All of this played in Naruto's mind as he had spoke to both his parents in the afterlife as well as Obito, they watched in shock and horror as Kurama finally escaped from Kashina's body and racked the woman in immense pain yet despite all of this and seeing the massive being before her now under the thrall of Obito, Kashina remained defiant and even when about to be killed remained as such. Soon Minato arrived and saved Kashina, taking her to a safe house with Naruto who was still trying to make sense of it all. Even with the fact she was severely weakened and losing life force, Kashina focused herself in shielding her son, the Amazons witnessed Minato and Obito fight and they were quick to see Minato use his seals to deflect a powerful attack from Kurama as the ninja managed to redirect the sphere of destruction from Konoha as its people, shocked by Kurama's appearance began to rally and fight back while saving the younger generations. Minato eventually would fight Obito again, managing to defeat Obito and remove his control of Kurama. Forcing Obito to retreat, but even when freed, Kurama's hatred for humanity manifested and it began to attack the people, killing many ninja, and civilians as well, it was only the intervention of Minato, Gamabunta who surprised the Amazons at not merely his size, but also his abilities and intelligence as while they had dealt with such things before they had not seen a toad of such size, power and intelligence before, and Kashina herself that they stopped Kurama. But there was only one way to end Kurama's rampage, sealing him and Kashina wished to be it. Even though it would kill her, even with her clan's immense vitality and stamina. She was on death's door, but was willing to die to defend Konoha. The people, and her family, even if it meant leaving behind her beloved husband and son and not being there to raise her only child, Minato however refused, stating that there was more to what had happened and he feared that the man who attacked them, if he could control Kurama before, would find a way to control him again, and without anyone whose chakra could resonate with Kurama's own, then Kurama would return again and cause untold damage. And that only left one option, one Kashina opposed. Sealing Kurama into Naruto, the Amazons watched Kashina try to convince Minato that it was wrong and she would do it, knowing fully well how lonely and painful the life of a Jinchuriki would be. But Minato explained that he had faith in their son. To be the hero that they and his sensei Jiraiya saw him to be. He also felt that Naruto may be the only one who could turn the once destructive powers of Kurama into something that can save the world, even more so since he stated that due to being in Keijushina's womb when she held Kurama, Naruto's chakra was the best one to resonate with the Biju's own, eventually Kashina consented and with her chains restraining Kurama, Minato used the Death God's seal to take the yin half of Kurama's chakra to seal it into himself at the cost of his own soul. Kurama despite being stripped of half his power was still massive and very powerful. And now aware of this plan decided to kill Naruto, the claw nearly impaled the still crying baby, had it not been for both Minato and Kashina using their own bodies to stop it, leading to them being fatally wounded. This bought enough time though for Kurama to be sealed into Naruto, the Amazons listened to Kashina and Minato's last words and Kashina stating she would leave something behind for Naruto to their crying son who now bore the same seal on his body as his mother did and then they died, leaving Naruto an orphan. Hippolyta was silent at this and so were the other Amazons, Diana looked at Naruto and saw that he was affected by this memory greatly, and decided to ask. How did you learn of this when you were just a baby? My parents each left a special soul imprint on me when they sealed Kurama into me, when they activated, they spoke to me about it and in my time in the afterlife, they told me more, my time when I was alive with my parents was brief, but I knew there and then that loved me with all that they were, and I was strong because of them, even if I never knew them growing up. Diana decided not to ask anymore for now and it seemed that the same sentiment was there for all the other Amazons as well. Thus Naruto continued, with him revealing that despite his father's dying wish that he be seen as a hero. Only few of Konoha's people would agree to it, including the former Hokage Hiruzen, the others, filled with anger, hatred, and grief would hate Naruto for the rest of his life, even going so far as to want to slay him even as a baby, Hiruzen put a stop to that and ordered henceforth that no one would speak of Kurama and also no harm should happen to Naruto under penalty of death, that was meant to shield him but the parents would poison their children's views of Naruto for years to come. The Amazons watched as Naruto grew up in Konoha, treated as a pariah at times beaten by the more daring of the villagers with thrown objects and never direct physical force. And insulted, some even went as far as to say that he should just die right there and now, they witnessed how hurt and confused Naruto was and how he eventually had a part of him hate the villagers for treating him like this for something he would not know of until later in life. 
Had it not been for the kindness of Hiruzen the reinstated Hokage after his father Minato's death, and by Tuchi and Ayame, Naruto would have gone half mad in anger and hatred, and although he used jokes, pranks, and more to counter the loneliness, bitterness, and anger in him, he would still in private stay in his old room and cry himself tea sleep and feel anger at what was done to him. Some of the Amazons were not too pleased with this as even though they too had issues with men. Treating children like this was wrong. Yes Naruto was a male child to be sure, but to be treated like this was appalling to them. Hippolyta herself was not pleased at all at this and yet looked to see that Naruto, the newly restored to life one did not carry any hatred in his heart anymore, to have developed the ability to look past such hatred in his youth must explain why he was never affected by the glares her people gave him on his arrival. If he has endured such animosity growing up in his world prior to his death and resurrection, then it makes sense that he would be far more tolerant than most when it concerns our issues with men. They saw how he would one day meet none other than his future wife Hanada Hayuga when in a cold and snowy day he came to her aid and despite being beaten still managed to help her, how he then gave the ruined scarf he had to the young girl and stood by her, unaware at he time how this would affect his future. They saw the bittersweet smile on Naruto's face when they saw this memory and saw the look of happiness and sadness there as a simple tear flowed down his face, Hippolyta recognized that look easily enough, after all she experienced it before, she however recalled what Alexa had said and decided not to question Naruto on this until much later when a clearer picture was present to them. It was also here in the same academy that he would meet his father figure Aruka who became his teacher who despite being forced to deal with Naruto's antics. His ramen obsession, and dealing with the fact that Kurama slew his own parents, leaving him as such an orphan as Naruto, still watched out for the young man, and here he also met his first friend Yoda who amazingly enough had the power to influence the weather but had been taken by the Anbu and Naruto was forced to have his memory of him erased until much later. Naruto would soon show from the conversations he had with Obito, Konan, and Nagato how Akatsuki was reformed into what it was now, Nagato and Obito sought out some of the most dangerous and vile ninja from various villages to form this mercenary band, wherein Nagato and Konan would be the public leaders while Obito would be the true leader in the shadows. The first would be naturally the members of the zombie duo, Kakazu and Hidan. Kakazu was a user of a powerful forbidden technique or kinjutsu that allowed him to survive for a century by stealing the hearts of his victims and using them to empower him. Each heart had a unique elemental chakra type in it and if one was lost, then Kakazu would replace the lost heart with a new one that had the same elemental affinity as the lost one. Hidan was a violent practitioner of a religion of God of Pain suffering, and death known as Jashin, Hidan's use of a brutal ritual in defiance to his former village made him immortal and with a new jutsu could entrap his foes after sampling their blood and make any injury he suffered be passed on to his victim while he derived pleasure from the pain he inflicted on himself while wounding or killing his foe who he called a sacrifice to Jashin. Such a technique was abhorrent to the Amazons and it showed as they were less than pleased at the sight of the man. The next was Sasori of the Hidden Sand or the Puppet Master who had willingly transformed himself in a battle puppet. Once they understood just how it was done, the Amazons were none too pleased at what this man did to himself and also how deadly he was since he was only vulnerable in the heart but any other location that could be attacked was useless as his body was now purely artificial and he could not feel pain anymore like a normal person. Next was Didera, a renegade ninja of Iwa who actually had mouths in his hands that allowed him to infuse a type of clay explosive with his chakra that could be made into animals of any size or even copies of himself with explosive results. The man was a wanted terrorist who could literally decimate entire battlefields or kill a single target with one of his creations that he called art. The next was Kisame Hoshigaki who was one of the seven mist swordsmen of Kiri. A known renegade who wielded the sentient sword Samahata. The Amazons were disturbed by his shark-like appearance, even more so when Samahata was exposed and in its true form, snarling and licking its lips in hunger and showing a toothy grin that was very disturbing Naruto revealed that Kisame was recruited personally by Obito because the man wanted to live in a world with no lies as his own sensei Samahata's previous wielder prior to him was a traitor. The next was Orochimaru, a traitor ninja to Konoha itself. And former teammate of Tsunade Senju and Jiraiya, the snake-like appearance and dark demeanor as well as sadistic aura the ninja excluded was troubling to the Amazons. But Hippolyta noted that Naruto had a rather dark scowl towards the man, and Naruto had good reason for such a dark look, as even though Orochimaru aided somewhat in the final battle he had not forgotten that it had been his actions that turned Sasuke into a criminal and traitor to Konoha, Hippolyta decided to wait for a better time as they looked at the next images. And the last showed yet another traitor to Konoha, Itachi Uchiha. A prodigy among the Uchiha who despite being at such a tender age of 10 was already a battle-hardened and experienced Anbu and became their head captain at the age of 13. He has a tie to none other than Sasuke Uchiha his younger brother. 
Sasuke not only loved but idolized his brother, and worked hard to finally reach a level that could make him able to stand not only out of his brother Itachi's shadow but to be able to show to Itachi that he was truly strong. However, Itachi was consumed by his own inner darkness and eventually murdered his own best friend Shisui Uchiha and soon became distant from his clan and soon committed the atrocity that was known as the Uchiha clan massacre, killing his former clansmen and leaving his parents for last. As Sasuke returned to see the horrors of it, Itachi soon revealed that he had done so to test his power, the Meigenkyo Sharingan, something many Uchiha had sought for years ever since Madara's supposed defeat, he made Sasuke relive the events through the Tsukiyomi and told his brother to hate him and feel nothing but anger and hatred towards him so that he could indeed kill him. Thus that event twisted Sasuke forever, turning him from a sweet, kind, and fun-loving youth to a cold, arrogant, angry, and revenge-driven youth, all he thought about was to one day have enough power needed to finally put his fallen brother to the grave and avenge their family. Many of the Amazons were disgusted by all of this, calling Itachi a murderous and cold-blooded monster who deserved to die in the most horrible manner for committing the act of slaying his own kin for power. They were unaware that Naruto had purposely held off his memories of the truth of the massacre and how in fact Itachi had felt immense guilt and self-loathing for having to kill his clan and leaving his parents for last and their acceptance of what was to come and asking him as he held his sword to their throats from behind to watch over his brother and that they were sorry for having to place him in this mess because of the rebellion they planned. And of course the truth was that Itachi had spared Sasuke because he did indeed love him and wanted Sasuke to be the one kill him so that the Uchiha name would be unstained by the dishonor of being labeled as traitors as their clan had indeed planned a coup in retaliation for them being singled out and isolated. Even more so ever since the aftermath of Kurama's rampage in Konoha, he took that a higher level as he hid the fact that Obito had come back to Konoha to kill off the Uchiha and destroy Konoha in some fashion while making it seem like the Uchiha were responsible so any who survived would be easier to convince to side with him and it was Itachi who managed to convince Obito to spare Konoha in exchange for killing off the Uchiha clan minus his brother Sasuke. Even though there was no need for such secrecy as there was no chance any Uchiha would be here in this world, the Uchiha were redeemed in the end, and that Obito, Itachi, and Sasuke had long since moved on from those events he had no intention of trusting such knowledge to anyone, not until he was absolutely certain they understood that not all was what it seemed and that he could trust them. Thus he was naturally thankful that none of them asked question on that front even though the lasso was still on him. Soon the images changed to him going to the academy and eventually meeting more of his classmates who would become his friends and allies in the future. Shikamaru Nara, Ino Yamanaka, Choji Akamichi, Kiba Inazuka, Shino Aburame, and Hanada who had become slightly older, and eventually meeting Sakura Haruno and Sasuke Uchiha himself, they also saw him deface the Hokage monument in an orange jumpsuit in broad daylight and they could not help but look at him with uncomprehending expressions as well as looks of disappointment and amusement, even more so when he was given the fourth degree by his less than amused sensei Uruka. In my defense, I was a kid then, the Amazons watched him struggle and fail at least three times but never give up until he finally got dragged into the mess with Mizuki and Aruka as the traitorous ninja had fooled Naruto to stealing the Forbidden Scroll and had planned to give it to Orochimaru in secret. Here they witnessed Aruka's words that changed Naruto despite the revelation that he held Kurama in him and how he would use the jutsu that would be his trademark for years to come, the Cage Bunshin no Jutsu. Soon the images changed to him joining the team under none other than Kakashi himself and though they had a less than stellar start. They would become a good team for the time they were together, as Sasuke and Naruto were now rivals though Naruto also saw Sasuke as something of a kindred spirit since they were alone for a long time, Sasuke did not show that at the time until it was only much later did he reveal that fact that he too was thankful for the presence of the others, Naruto naturally blocked a particular incident between him and Sasuke, best not to bring that up. Unfortunately for Naruto, the next set of memories came up, and there was one that stood out the most, this was the memory that haunted him as he grew up, the dreaded first bell test he had with the whole team against Kakashi, and it was not long before the whole event played out, he cited mentally as he recalled those memories on this event very much, and soon, much to his embarrassment, the images finally showed him being caught off guard by Kakashi. And introduced to the thousand years of death jutsu. That incident in the training field, was one he could do well not to remember, but it was there for all to see, and it was fairly obvious that it was something none of the Amazons had ever seen before, some were gaping in shock, Others shook their heads in disgust. Others were trying their hardest not to laugh. Others were also rubbing their eyes as if thinking that what they saw was a fluke or something. Diana commented after a moment or two though it was clear that she was trying her best not to laugh at him, it would have been quite rude after all. Did that actually happen? Naruto blushed and since the lasso was on him, he told the truth. Yes it did happen, not one of my finest moments to be sure, and part of me wishes to never see that again. 
Hippolyta was also trying hard not to laugh and spoke. I can see why, the images continued to show how Naruto, Sakura and Sasuke would go on missions with Kakashi and soon they saw the mission that would start the path that would define Naruto in the years to come, the mission in the Land of Waves. Soon they met Haku and Zabuza and they witnessed the first time Naruto would summon Kurama's power when he suspected Sasuke was killed by Haku near the end of the mission, but at this time Naruto is unaware of the power he uses subconsciously, they saw the speech between Haku and Naruto and how in a way this speech would pass on a part that would forge Naruto on when one finds something worth fighting for, only then will they become strong. The conversation between Zabuza and Naruto was also telling in how he, a young kid had managed to break through the cold killer facade of the man who had killed so many and made him become a human being, not a tool, they saw how the mission ended and in turn they soon were able to see the Chunin exams. They were soon able to witness the Chunin exams and here was where Naruto would meet yet another series of people who would define him in the future. The first being Rock Lee, a taijutsu user who was like Naruto had a genius rival in Neji Hyuga in his own team and who got to where he was through hard work, sweat blood, and tears, similar indeed to Naruto as well. Another was naturally the Suna Shinobi and fellow Jinchuriki Gara of the Sand, who in many ways was a dark mirror to Naruto but would one day become one of Naruto's trusted allies and friends, and his encounter with Gara's siblings Tamari and Konkuru. He would also meet Kabuto, Orochimaru's subordinate and the deadly ninja traitor himself in the progressing moments of the exam. This also allowed the Amazons to meet many other ninja as well from the male and female side of the gender line, some of whom would become part of the groups that would forge Naruto into who he will be, they saw him and his team fight in the forest of death and the event that would bring Sasuke and Naruto to a head as enemies when Orochimaru bit Sasuke in the neck and inject the cursed seal into the Uchiha youth. The events played on with Naruto winning his place in the semi-finals and his promise to avenge Hanada when she was badly hurt in fighting her cousin Neji, they soon saw his training with Ebisu and eventually meeting none other than Jiraiya, needless to say the man screamed pervert in so many ways that many Amazons frowned at him when they saw him act like that around women, Naruto sighed at that and replied. Ah, ol Aero Senin, Diana asked while keeping an eye on Jiraiya. What does that mean? My pet nickname for him, it basically means perverted hermit, a pervy sage since he never hides his perversion from anyone and I swear he actually is proud of being a pervert, he never liked that name though whenever I said it. Hippolyta snorted, I can see why, here Naruto frowned a bit and made his displeasure known. Hey, don't think he was that bad, sure he had no problems being a pervert but he told me old man Hiruzen was even worse than he was. And after some stunts I did pull on the old man, I found out he was right, besides despite being a ninja he loved peace and felt that the younger generation was the best solution to ending the hatred that was in the system of the ninja world, he also was very loyal to Konoha down to the bones and he grew up to be a great hero and a powerful ninja, and perverted tendencies aside, he did have his limits on such things, namely with Tsunade Obasan around. Who is that? Naruto recalled Tsunade and soon the Amazon saw a tall blonde woman who had a very fine figure who wore a kimono top long pants, sandals, a long coat of green, she had her hair in two tails in the back and carried herself with a strong level of confidence and power that was matched only by Hippolyta, she also happened to possess a strong level of beauty that was natural and put her in par with the Amazons, close to Diana and her mother, the rather large bust also seemed to add weight to the looks, Naruto soon explained who she was when Donna asked him who Tsunade was. She is Tsunade Senju, one of the last Senju clan members. And since Mito Uzumaki was her grandmother that makes her my maternal relative. She is an exceptionally skilled kunochi in her own right and is the founder of the medic nin system and also a skilled healer and a fierce fighter. Apart from those things Tsunade is also known for her monstrous strength. So much so she can kill men with just a punch without even using her full might behind that blow, combine that with her immense tolerance for pain, durability and speed, only the highest level fighters would dare to take her on being a senju and an uzumaki on both sides her life force is far stronger along with her stamina and vitality, her chakra reserves were very potent and so was her control of her chakra so she can use all manner of jutsu to maximum effect with minimum loss. She also has remarkable skills in genjutsu, fuenjutsu and other arts, namely since she was able to make organic prosthetic limbs from the cells of her grandfather, which I happen to have as a replacement for my own, lost arm. That made the Amazons all the more curious but they did not stop him from continuing. She also happens to be one of the only two female cage in my world. That got the interest of the Amazons and Hippolyta decided to ask that question. So women in your world are not restricted because of gender? Naruto gave a raised eyebrow and replied while still under the influence of the lasso. In my world there is no such thing as gender bias or that dumb idea that women are weak and have no say in anything. Such beliefs are stupid and no longer valid, 
Any man who spouts such nonsense in my world either is dumber than dirt or has a very blatant disregard for his life and as such usually don't not live very long. Men and women hold equal rights and have every option open to them to reach their goals and become stronger. Many kunoichi rose to great fame and recognition in my world, my mother and Tsunade among them, and even those who are not kunoichi have risen to high status and recognition in their respective lands through hard work and lineage. This actually makes the Amazons more relaxed as the lasso's power was still active and thus they all knew he spoke the truth to them, as for Hippolyta as well as both Diana and Donna, this made them all the more eager to see more, still this tie, not merely blood tie to be sure, between Tsunade and Naruto was interesting to Diana as she spoke. She was like a mother to you, Naruto smiled at that and nodded. Yes she was, she had bad habits to be sure, who hasn't? But she always had faith in the younger generation and never saw Jinchuriki as tools to be discarded like trash. She had a bad life losing her brother and her loved one Anz was a big cynic when I met her, but in the end she and I became close to the point of being family, I am the only guy who has the guts to call her grandmother or Obasan, and I am the only guy she's ever going to allow to call her that in her face, anyone else try that they get a fist in the face and be in a hospital or a coffin. Artemis then spoke, so why this was, Jiraiya very restrained in regards to his perversion around her. Naruto then gave a smile as he recalled the story easily and showed it. Because one time she caught him peeping at her when she was bathing in the hot springs I think when they were still in the same team, needless to say she was angry and gave him such a thrashing, which resulted in both his arms broken, six broken ribs, and several ruptured internal organs and possibly one killer of a concussion, in fact if he had not been taken to a hospital he would have died, needless to say that convinced Aero Senen to behave when she was around. That made Artemis smirk a bit in approval and spoke. I like this Tsunade, Naruto shrugged and replied. Still, Tsunade Obasan and Aero Senen remained good friends and allies, and he actually was in love with Tsunade for a very long time, he knew he never had a chance with her but that never stopped him and perverted tendencies as well as overt love for Thetrix aside, he knew when to be serious. Hippolyta soon decided that there would be time for more discussions later as they moved back to the events of these, Chunin exams and their aftermath. Namely his battle with Kiba and Akamaru which made them look at him with amusement. And some level of disgust on how he, defeated Kiba in the end. Naruto merely shrugged at that and they witnessed the battles to follow. Namely between Tamari and Tenten, Hanada and Neji, and soon against Lee and Gara with Lee's physical performance and the use of the gates actually making some Amazons look on in surprise. The most being Donna at seeing the speed and power in Lee's attacks, however they were not pleased with how Gara crippled Lee and yet were impressed by the fact that Lee, relying solely on muscle memory still stood up, ready to fight even with a crushed arm and leg, this was one of the many events that would shape the blonde along with his vow to defeat Neji and his views on destiny. They soon saw him dealing with the removal of the seal on his body courtesy of Orochimaru thanks to Jiraiya in the water walking exercise and soon summoning the very same toad that his father summoned after nearly falling down a ravine something Naruto did not ever forget long ago and the Amazons looked in keen interest as Gamabunta and Naruto faced off with one another. They had to admire the blonde for having the courage to actually berate such a massive and obviously intelligent and powerful being right in its eyes or rather face and challenging it to throw him off as he planned to stay there until Gamabunta accepted him as his master. The sight of the young man trying to hold on for dear life to stay on top of a massive talking intelligent toad to prove that he summoned him and not his perverted shinobi of a teacher, was rather interesting to them. Even the normally sarcastic Artemis was impressed at the display, even more so when Gamabunta really thrashed the place and leapt around to throw Naruto off. Naruto sighed in absolute amusement and spoke once more. Ah, my first time dealing with Boss Toad when I met him all those years ago when I was still a youngster, I still recall all the times I got sent up to the sky by him when he leapt and trying to hold on for dear life when we went crashing back down, ought to be young and stupid again. That actually made the Amazons chuckle as they found his expressions on said incidents outright entertaining. The images soon showed that he not only survived the ordeal but had indeed earned the respect of Gamabunta for surviving that long on him with only the fourth Hokage, Naruto's father being the one he would ever allow to ride on his head with no complaints, soon the images changed to him meeting none other than Gara again when the San Shinobi intended to murder Rock Lee in his sleep after he had crushed Rock Lee's arm and leg in their battle brutally. It was here that he and Shikamaru stopped Gara, and here Gara revealed his own Jinchuriki status to Naruto, who had at this time had no idea that Gara was like him, but it was clear that unlike him, Gara had the worst of it and was more driven by hatred, making Naruto realize that he was looking at a dark version of himself, even more so when Naruto was told by Gara on how he became a Jinchuriki, though not all the details were there. Of course, in his time in the afterlife, Naruto managed to chat with both Gara and Rasa. Gara's father, 
He did not have any love for what Rasa put his own son through but made no issue of it since it was clear to him that both Rasa and Gara had mended fences when they met in the Fourth Shinobi War. Gara explained how it happened and Naruto had to admit that it was one of the few things that made using the Edo Tensai somewhat acceptable apart from him seeing his father, Itachi, the Hokage, and of course old man Hiruzen again, plus while in the afterlife, Rasa and Gara did become like a family alongside Gara's mother and Rasa's wife, along of course with Konkuru and Tamari, he decided that until he could truly rust the Amazons at full, this was yet another secret he would keep. The images soon came to him meeting Hanada again and chatting about his own growing doubts and how she inspired him to not give up, seeing and recalling that memory once more made Naruto smile as he recalled just how much of an impact they both had towards one another and how he felt like a louse for not knowing about the depth of Hanada's feeling until much later in life, Kami he hated being dense at times. Soon they imaged changed to him fighting with Neji and despite his bad state, he still managed to pull off moves and attacks which were interesting and ingenious. The Amazon saw his defiance and courage even when his chakra was cut and soon he summoned Karama's chakra and with it plus a very ingenious move, bested Neji, much to the shock of all who watched who had once thought Naruto would not win against Neji since Neji was a genius compared to Naruto at the time. In the end, Naruto's speech against the idea that destiny cannot be changed struck a chord with Neji and even among the Amazons, even more so when he reminded Neji that he failed three times and the same jutsu that Neji said was his trademark was actually the one he stank at the most and he told him to stop harping that nonsense about fate because if he and Lee could defy fate and stand up and be here in this field, what's stopping someone like him from doing the same? They witnessed the remaining matches until the final one that soon led to the signal for the invasion of Konoha by Suna to begin. The battle was harsh and brutal as the Konoha ninja were caught off guard by the attack of their supposed allies, the fact that a number of Otto ninja joined in the assault added to that, but eventually Konoha won the battle when their forces rallied and the power wielded by the ninja that called it home was seen which was why it had a strong military in its own right. Naruto despite being outmatched by Gara, eventually defeated his fellow Jinchuriki in combat, using, a more combat-oriented move similar to the one used by Kakashi, that in summoning Gamabunta into battle with Shukaku, which was needed when the Amazon saw how massive the sand raccoon was and that despite not being as strong as Kurama was still not one to look down on if one wished to remain alive. His conversation with Gara was heard and soon he was aided by Sasuke though they saw that the cursed seal was on him as well. But like all wars, Konoha had suffered, not only from the slain ninja of their forces, but the loss of Hiruzen who fought the Kei's cage, only for it to be none other than Orochimaru who used Edo Tensai to force Hiruzen to fight the two Senju siblings forcing Hiruzen to use the same jutsu that took the life of Minato to seal the souls of the two ninja and had tried to use the same to end his former student, only to accept only severing Orochimaru's arms in soul terms. The old man died with a smile on his face, and was honored greatly for his sacrifice, Naruto himself wept at the death of the old man, and this was yet another event that would shape him for the rest of his life. But in the days to come, Naruto would face more challenges to come. Naruto soon showed them the manner of Konoha's reconstruction and then how he had asked to be taught the Chidori from Kakashi and how he had been denied that by his sensei. However the Amazons wondered just what was the reason why his own sensei would refuse to teach him as it was his duty to teach his students evenly. Naruto was also thinking about that part a long time ago, only difference was he knew now why his lightning was not his true elemental affinity and he had actually trained in the jutsu much later in his life, though he did it rather differently than Sasuke did. Why would he refuse to teach you as he is your, mentor as it were? Naruto looked at the Amazon asking that question and saw that it was Philippus herself and could understand just why she was asking the question. At the time Kakashi was teaching Sasuke and would have taught me as well but it was Jiraiya who convinced him to focus on Sasuke and he dealt with me. And why is that the case? Naruto had to admit that when he was a kid. He wondered briefly if Kakashi had favoritism towards Sasuke. But that was then, he now realized that with Itachi being the only living Uchiha second to Sasuke. And the truth of his mission against the Uchiha clan not yet known to him. Kakashi and Sasuke, it would have to fall to Kakashi to train Sasuke as despite being a non-Uchiha. Experience-wise, apart from Itachi to be certain, Kakashi was the only one who could help Sasuke, there was also the fact that much later in his youth he learned that he did not possess an affinity to lightning chakra which was the basis of the Chidori, and the fact that without the Sharingan to counter any sudden changes from the movement of his enemies, one using the Chidori had to go in a straight line, a risky move if an enemy evaded the attack. Besides, if he had not gone with Jiraiya, he would have never learned the Rasengan and a few other things that would play well into him becoming the man he was now, plus meeting the women who would become part of his life helped, with Tsunade being a mother figure, grandmother figure and Shizune becoming like a big sister to him. Because at the time, 
Kakashi was the only one who had the Sharingan who was aligned with Konoha even if he was not a full-blooded Uchiha himself, so he had to be the one as he had been using the Sharingan the longest apart from Itachi, and in a way, I did indeed learn some new techniques from the pervy sage. The Amazons witnessed the two travel and while none too pleased with Jiraiya's use of money. They saw him use the Rasengan and explained that this was the jutsu he planned to teach Naruto. It was clear that seeing the technique in Naruto's memories had gained the interest of the Amazons for their own reasons yet they admitted that the technique, while alien to them was effective, even more so when the technique was used on a rogue ninja. They witnessed Naruto struggle to learn the technique and eventually find ways to overcome some of the obstacles while they searched for Tsunade, they actually found the idea of him being inspired by a kitten playing around with a ball of yarn rather, amusing but also innovative, then they saw him work in the next step despite numerous failures, this dedication and work ethic was of interest to them. However things were not going to be easy as they had to deal with none other than Akatsuki members Itachi Uchiha and Kisame Hoshigaki, the situation became more complicated when Sasuke appeared and was deathly intent on slaying Itachi, sadly even though they never met Sasuke or Itachi personally, the Amazons were very unsure of the younger brother's chance of success, Diana soon asked a question as she wondered just how Sasuke learned that his sibling was around. How did Sasuke learn of Itachi being around? Itachi and Kisame came to Konoha to try and track me down but had been spotted by Junin Asuma Serutobi and Yuhi Kuranai. Both were the sensei of their own teams as Kakakushi sensei was, Asuma was leader of the team of Ino Yamanaka of the Yamanaka clan, Choji Akamichi of the Akamichi clan, and Shikamaru Nara of the Nara clan, Kuranai was the leader of the team of my future wife Hanada Hayuga of the Hayuga clan, Kiba Inazuka of the Inazuka clan, and Shino Abarame of the Abarame clan they intercepted the pair and while initially having an edge they were in a dire way until my sensei arrived to help them. Naruto naturally got the details of what happened years later from Kurenai and Kakashi when they were still alive, he would have asked Asuma but by the time he heard that the Junin was involved, Hidan had already killed him, that and the fact Itachi filled him in later in the afterlife on what happened as well. But Itachi used Tsukiyomi on my sensei that made him suffer what felt three days of intense torture in a realm of illusions but in the real world. Only a few minutes would pass, it was only when made a guy. Rock Lee's sensei who was actually adept at fighting Sharingan users that they got out of that mess, they had attempted to hide the truth from Sasuke since they were all well aware that my old teammate had the desire to kill Itachi, but one of the other shinobi had arrived and demanded if it was true that Itachi had been there and looking for me, right in earshot of Sasuke, and it led to the moment that Itachi attacked Sasuke with the same technique he used on our sensei. He never liked revealing that part and Itachi himself in the afterlife personally admitted that using it on Sasuke was something he was not proud of. But it had played its part in shaping Sasuke and he accepted that, they witnessed the outcome of the meeting, Sasuke being sent back to Konoha for recovery as Itachi and Kisame retreated, here Jiraiya would reveal Akatsuki to Naruto and also their goal in extracting the biju from others like him, he however had no plans on letting that happen and soon they would witness the meeting between him and Tsunade when they finally found the blonde Sanin in a bar with Shizune. They soon witnessed his meeting with Tsunade Senju and apparently they had no idea that she was something of a drunkard and had one hell of a gambling addiction, coupled that with what Naruto described as notoriously bad luck, the result was not a good one, still despite this it was clear that he held the woman in high regard so they decided to wait for more to be shown to them as Naruto explained in detail how this meeting turned out and how the two of them became like family. Of course it didn't help matters that whenever her luck in gambling changed for the better something bad usually was on the horizon for her, and our arrival was at a very, very bad time. Hippolyta was curious with that statement but decided to observe for now and soon she and the other Amazons who were curious got their answer as Tsunade revealed that she had encountered Orochimaru alongside Shizune. Apparently the snake Sanin despite the loss of his limbs due to Hiruzen knew that he could be helped by Tsunade and had extended a powerful offer to his former comrade in arms and that was in exchange for bringing him back full use of his arms via medical jutsu. He would use the Edo Tenshi to bring back two very important people in her life who she lost. And to the shock of the Amazons it seemed to have a powerful effect on the blonde Sanin which resulted in her being drunk when Naruto and Jiraiya found her, needless to say the revelation of Orochimaru coming to her did not sit well with Naruto or Jiraiya, but it was Tsunade's bad mouthing the Hokage and what it meant in her bitter state that enraged Naruto and naturally led to a confrontation between the two. She looked at the face off intently and could understand the reason on why Naruto was furious, even though it was clear that at this time period of his life he had no idea that the fourth Hokage was his father. Diana herself was also very much curious to see how this fight would turn out and also learn how this relationship grew between Tsunade and Naruto, the same could be said for Donna as well as some of the Amazons. Naruto recalled that very well but did not mind it too much. 
It was after all something that would define his relationship with Tsunade who was in truth his relative due to her being half Uzumaki. Of course he could see that not everyone shared the same balanced opinion that he had for Tsunade, though in hindsight they at least did not react too badly. The battle played out between the two and Tsunade was actually surprised by Naruto's resolve and even more so when seeing him use the Rasengan for the first time at her, though at the time it was still incomplete and unstable, needless to say he did not hit her accurately and after some serious talking he dared to master the Rasengan in one week with Tsunade finally using her necklace as collateral. He trained to prove Tsunade wrong and several the halfway mark when he was visited by Shizune and began to explain the actions and nature of Tsunade. Though at the time Naruto was not the least bit willing to listen, it was here that he insulted Tsunade greatly for her actions and words until Shizune finally revealed Tsunade had lost two very important people in her life, one made her the last of the Senju, and the other was the love of her life and who shared her dreams and how it was the necklace that he was now attempting to win from her that had a hand in their deaths in a sense. Diana recovered a bit and spoke to Naruto as she now saw the pattern on why despite knowing how vile he was, Tsunade was tempted to help him. It was her brother and her deceased love that Orochimaru intended to bring back to life using that Idan Tenshi? Naruto nodded and spoke of what he knew of it though he kept in mind not to go too deeply into details as this happened long before his time and even when he finally manged to meet Dan and Nawaki in the afterlife and chat with them, he decided never to ask how they died as it was not his place to do so. I never knew all the details and I refused to ask Dan and Nawaki even when I met them in the afterlife. But from what Shizun Nichan told me, Nawaki was pretty much like me in our youth. Loud, boisterous, dedicated, and more, heck we even at some point looked the same then. Tsunade gave him her necklace as he wanted to be Hokage and be the best Hokage that Konoha would have and he would bring pride back to the Senju name. Sadly, he was killed at the same age I was when I met Tsunade on a mission, I never knew how bad it was, but it was bad enough that even though he was brought back, Tsunade hardly recognized him, the only thing that could tell her that this was her beloved younger brother was the necklace, with that, Tsunade lost Nawaki and as far as things went because the last full-blooded Senju left alive in the world. All I know about the aftermath of it was that she was in mourning for a week or so, and it was only her promise to him that she would carry on that she finally got back to doing what she could for Konoha. Diana nodded and despite herself looked at her sister Donna and wondered how she would have handled herself had she been in Tsunade's place now. If there had been someone who could bring Donna back from the dead to her if her sister had been slain somehow, but in exchange doing so would help to bring back the powers of a dark monster. It was therefore something that made her realize how difficult it would be for Tsunade to make such a choice even though it would have eased her feelings of guilt and disgust for being unable to save her only living sibling. Diana was not the only one to think that though in her case. Hippolyta herself could understand how despondent Tsunade was, losing family was always painful, even more so when the life lost is not only so young, but also if it made you the last of your family, she also was able to see the appearance of Nawaki and had to admit that he resembled Naruto greatly in terms of youth, the other Amazons were still silent but they were indeed paying attention to this as they wanted to see how all these events play out. Naruto shook his head at that, recalling how he began to understand just why Tsunade was such a bitter woman then, but he knew that he had a story to tell so he continued. Eventually Tsunade made requests to the Hokage and the Jonin Council to allow medic nin of either gender to be assigned to all ninja teams or have one of them trained to some degree in medical jutsu in order to lessen the losses suffered in the field. Not all agreed with it for one reason or another, but Tsunade Obasan was very serious. It was also here that she met Dan, her fiancé who was actually Shizun's uncle, he too wanted to help Konoha and unlike some of the wizened old farts back then in the day he had his head on straight, naturally he and Tsunade hit it off and after several months of courting and even doing missions together, Dan made the more to propose to Tsunade and vow to be Hokage someday, she had some misgivings on this but Tsunade gave Dan the necklace, and in the end. Alexa spoke next, he died as well. Yes, only difference was that unlike last time according to Shizun Nichan Tsunade was there. But even when she poured all of her power, knowledge, and more into trying to save him, Dan died right before her. She was lost there and then and developed a deep-seated fear of blood soon after. No longer willing to stay in Konoha even though the medic nin system she and Dan fought for was approved. She left with on Shizun and that pet pig of hers Tun Tun to accompany her and her holding on to the necklace to never allow the curse it carried to claim another life, they were the ones Orochimaru used as a set of bargaining chips to convince Tsunade to heal him and allow him to wipe Konoha off the map, Jiraiya did warn her that if she did side with Orochimaru, then regardless of his still present affections for her, he would kill her. The Amazons were silent at this and merely continued to witness the memories play out. And soon they witnessed the battle between Tsunade and Orochimaru as well as Kabuto. 
Naruto soon explained that from his discussions with Tsunade much later in their lives she revealed that she had instead planned to kill Orochimaru instead of healing him and had no intention of letting Dan and Nawaka's dreams be sullied by her former teammate. That along with the fact that if she did allow it to happen, the Edo Tenshi would the most vile travesty one did to the dead and neither Nawaki nor Dan would ever forgive her for it, that and she knew that the very second he got what he wanted, Orochimaru would no doubt use both her brother and lover to kill her once he took away their free will. The Amazons witnessed Tsunade fight both Orochimaru and Kabuto for a time but Kabuto was quick to use Tsunade's fear of blood against here. Thus despite unleashing from very powerful attacks, the only female Sanin's phobia stopped her momentum and now she was in danger. It was here that he, Jiraiya and Shizune arrived, but with Tsunade drugging Jiraiya earlier. It was not a good situation, even more so when Naruto, who was not as powerful as he was now faced off with Kabuto, who he knew now to be a spy, they witnessed him use a novel way to create the Rasengan with the use of Cage Bunshin, much to the amazement of Tsunade as the Rasengan was not an incomplete one but a fully formed Rasengan and it was undeniably a powerful one and smashing it hard into Kabuto, it seemed to be a victory but Naruto had been attacked earlier and he was actually dying as Kabuto's use of medical chakra had severed the muscles in his heart and he was going to die. That was shocking for Alexa as the idea of someone using such potent healing techniques to commit murder was offensive to her as a healer. And the same could be said for the other healers who had been impressed by this healing jutsu that the ninja of Naruto's land favored. But despite Kabuto's prediction that Naruto would die Tsunade refused to let him die, never again and lo and behold, despite her past tragedies and her pain, she brought Naruto back from the brink of death, and even when Orochimaru sought to end Naruto due to his powerful use of the Rasengan, Tsunade had changed as she willingly stood to defend Naruto, after forcing Orochimaru back she now decided to go into the fight, no longer willing to do nothing else and stand beside Jiraiya. Seeing Tsunade fight in battle, no longer affected by her fear of blood, was quite an eyeful for the Amazons as she was certainly living up to the praise Naruto heaped on her, even more so when she was actually stabbed by a sword and yet had the physical and mental will to ignore the pain and fight back, the fact that the wounds were by all rights fatal to any normal person showed to them just how potent and strong this Tsunade was to the Amazons. They were also impressed by the fact that she was able to summon up her power to heal all her injuries and then summon a massive slug. At first one would think that such an ability would be odd, but the fact that the creature could speak as well as show intelligence when Tsunade spoke to it, the only reason Naruto knew of this was due to his time in the afterlife, hearing the bloodthirsty nature of Manda and how he saw his fellow summons as well as his own summoner made the warrior women very wary of him. And needless to say, she lived up to the praise that Naruto gave to her and even though she was not as fast as she was. And even though she and Jiraiya were not at full strength they showed immense skill and power which explained to them how come Naruto held both in high regard. Despite this Orochimaru managed to leave the battleground and after some time, Tsunade gave her necklace to Naruto and they soon went back to Konoha and the blonde Sanin took the position of Hokage and worked on curing the injured, namely Rock Lee and eventually Sasuke though most of his more serious injuries were of the emotional and mental kind, and though they took on a number of missions, it was clear that Sasuke was deep in thought about how he had been easily bested by his brother. It was not long before one final mission resulted in Sasuke being taken to medical once more. But soon the Amazons saw the two teammates clash, even more so when the two came to the roof of the hospital with a very worried Sakura who did not want this to happen. But it was clear that the now irate and angry Sasuke was not deterred and neither was Naruto and soon they clashed, and the intent in their attacks was seen by the Amazons, it was when the two were now using the Rasengan and the Chidori in the climax of the confrontation that it seemed to have reached a point that they would actually kill one another, it was only when Kakashi himself came in and stopped them that the whole situation was resolved. But it was clear that this had shown that Naruto and Sasuke were in a sense now enemies though it was clear that Naruto still had no desire for this situation to play out anymore. Naruto and Sakura spoke of it and it was clear to Naruto that Sakura's feelings for Sasuke were not merely because he was good looking or whatnot. But because she did love him and wanted him not to go any further into the darkness, and she did not want any more fighting between him and Sasuke, but sadly it was not long before Naruto was told that Sasuke had been seen with the Sound 4 and Sakura had tried to stop him but had been knocked out and left, he, along with Shikamaru, Choji, Kiba and Akamaru, as well as Neji Hayuga moved out to track him down and prevent Orochimaru from taking him. They also saw the emotions shown by Naruto when he promises Sakura that he will bring Sasuke back and make her smile again. Donna soon spoke of this, noticing something and recalling just how Naruto seemed to act when he saw Sakura hugging Sasuke when the young Uchiha survivor awoke. You were, in love with Sakura then? Naruto nodded. I was, I had a crush on Sakura for a long while and even though it lessened somewhat as we got older, it was still there, 
At the time I was not that aware of Hanada's affection for me and I personally found her to be weird and shy, but I liked her as a friend then, I never knew about how much she loved me until much later. The truth in that statement was seen by the Amazons and Alexa then spoke on that. You were unaware. Oh yes I was, not only that, I was not exactly popular in my village then considering who I was and what I carried, at any rate, we had to deal with THGE Sound 4 and while I did have my brief battles with them, it was my fellow teammates who fought them, my real fight was with Sasuke. And true enough the images showed his brief but meaningful encounters with the Sound 4 and the strongest encounter was when he faced none other than the last of the Kagaya clan, Kimimaro, the ninja's use of his own skeleton and bones as weapons for range and close combat was rather, disconcerting for the Amazons as they had not thought it was possible for someone to actually use his or her own bones in such a manner and somehow remain alive as well. Artemis was quick to comment on that fact as her look of disgust was obvious. How in the name of the gods is he doing that and yet remain alive? Not really sure, all I know of him was what I learned of his clan. Which was the Kagaya clan, related to Princess Kagaya somehow as well to be sure. The Kagaya clan were from the land of water and were among the clans who took serious part in the wars there that led to the Kekai Jenke purges. They were in what I learned the worst since they were engrossed in the chance to wage war and bloodshed they willingly attacked Kirigakir and fought to the last man and woman. Even child solely for the chance for wholesale slaughter, but even among such a blood-lusting clan like their own, they were actually terrified of Kimimaro because he was the only one of their clan to have the Kekai Jenke that you all see now, that alone should telephone you that despite his looks, Kimimaro was no weakling even if he was being killed by a major sickness. Naruto's words were spot on as they saw that he was more than able to fight with speed and power and fought like a true killer. Even when Naruto used a portion of Kurama's power, Kimimaro was more than able to hold his own even when outnumbered, he delayed Naruto long enough for Sasuke to finally escape and it was only when Rock Lee arrived that Naruto finally had the opening he needed to track down Sasuke, and track him down he did, but this was not going to go the way Naruto hoped it would as he finally faced Sasuke. The Amazons witnessed the battle between Sasuke and Naruto unfold ironically enough in the Valley of the End. The very same place that had been the site where the founders of Konoha, Hashirama Senju and Madara Uchiha would one day fight their own personal war to the death. Despite Naruto's attempts to try and stop the fall of his friend and also speak or knock some sense into him. It was clear that Sasuke was more determined to side with Orochimaru to get the power he needed to kill Itachi. Even if it meant turning on his own team, friends, and his village, the battle between the two former friends and teammates was fierce and utterly brutal, even more so when they saw Sasuke actually use his Chidori to spear Naruto in the chest, had he not moved his body at the right moment, he would have died in that instant as the blow was aimed directly at the heart, a fatal spot no matter who you were. The other Amazons were looking at the site with various looks of shock. Disgust and whatnot, as for Naruto himself, he could not help but grimace at the memory, sure he made peace with Sasuke long ago. But seeing this memory again was hardly pleasant let alone recalling the pain of the blow, still reliving the memory was something he knew he had to do in order to see that all questions of his origins were put to rest, he looked at the Amazons and he could tell that they were trying to digest just how it had come to this. Hippolyta looked at the whole image intently and she could see that the incident was of great significance for the blonde though she could not help but wince at the sight of the lightning covered fist appearing out at the back of the blonde in his past, and despite herself she had to admit that the sight of the young blonde still alive though barely from such a brutal move was indeed worthy of respect. 13, 13 and he was already in battles that could have killed any youth without training his age, but this. By Hera, Diana could not help but stare at the sight before her, she knew that these were memories and she was only looking at them but the sight of the blonde youth being speared like that by his former best friend and teammate was still chilling, Donna herself gulped and turned away from the sight, not wanting to see more of this. She was not the only one as even Philippus was wide-eyed at the sight of such a blow. You managed to survive such a fierce blow. Yeah, barely moved my heart out of the way then, if I was a bit slower, I'd be dead. The rest of the Amazons agreed and Diana could not help but look at the horrific sight as Sasuke then taunted Naruto while his arm was still there right through Naruto's body. The images then switched to the two finally going all out as Naruto finally summoned the chakra cloak of Kurama. Though it was still in the blood red form that it was then. Not to be outdone. Sasuke unleashed his cursed seal and with that and the Sharingan managed to stand up to Naruto and eventually used a move that had many Amazons gasping as the blow had actually snapped Naruto's neck. However it was here that Kurama decided to get directly involved and saved Naruto's life. Healing him and granting him a power that at the time he had no control over, they witnessed him stand up and then attack Sasuke with the cloak now surrounding him and taking a more lupine form with one tail, 
Naruto recalled that moment all too well and knew what was coming as he finally used Kurama's first tailed cloak form. The transformation was all too familiar and already the bloody anger and hatred that Kurama had in the past guided him back before he and the Biju became friends. Naruto recalled that moment very well and sighed mentally to himself. Oh yeah. This is going to be interesting to see again. Interesting didn't even cover it, as it was not long before the Amazons saw the power that Kurama gave Naruto even though the two were still very much at odds with one another. The devastating blows Naruto unleashed and the fact that his chakra was now not only solid but could also move on its own accord was something Sasuke could not prepare for. The power of the strike Naruto unleashed on him at the beginning was severe and using the chakra to create spare limbs to toss and thrash Sasuke around tore the land around them even more, the fight proved to be a real bloody affair and it seemed that even with the cursed seal Sasuke was in trouble, until he finally unleashed the second form, and turned into, well, a monster that was unknown to the Amazons as they stared at his new form, and what powers it had given him at the cost of driving him even closer to the darkness that Naruto was trying to save him from. Even so, they could not help but look on in surprise at how the battle between the now transformed teens and the destruction they unleashed on one another was pretty much intense between them. It was not long before the Amazons witnessed the final clash and how Naruto had been unable to carry on but instead of slaying him when H could. Sasuke left Naruto alone and soon he was rescued by Kakashi who was disheartened that it had come to this. They witnessed him promise to rescue Sasuke to Sakura and his defiance to Jiraiya's advice to drop it and move on as he did when he tried to dissuade Orochimaru years ago, showing that he too had been in the same situation as Naruto was, but he decided that if Naruto was dead set on this, then he would need to train and improve himself, for now though he would remain in Konoha until he got back to begin the journey. Hippolyta looked at the images before her that highlighted some of the many trials that Naruto would undergo before going into a three-year training journey alongside Jiraiya. Many of them were interesting misadventures, some had even made the Amazons laugh in amusement. A much-needed distraction from the revelations of this young man's past, but others had played in a sense their very own role in forging Naruto into the person before them all, she personally found the incident with the curry of life very amusing and the same could be said for Diana and Donna, even Artemis barked a bit in amusement when she saw him literally pass out from the first batch that he had tried of the curry, Philippus merely raised an eyebrow and smirked in amusement at the sight. Alexa actually gulped and looked at him, was it really that potent? Naruto groaned a bit at the memory but smiled a bit. Yes it was, and, to my everlasting shame, Bushy Brows managed to convince me when we were older to come back with him to try it again, I was in hospital for a week after that. This amused the Amazons and soon as Jiraiya returned, they knew that the second half of Naruto's life soon to be seen, naturally they witnessed his leaving the village and making his promise to come back soon and become not only Hokage but also to return Sasuke back. The missions he undertook prior to finally going with Jiraiya. The two years of intense training to refine his skills and also ensure that he was stronger for the many dangers and tests he would one day face. Not only to rescue Sasuke from his dark path, but Akatsuki as well for there was no doubt they were not going to be quiet forever. They saw that despite his perverted tendencies, Jiraiya worked hard to teach Naruto to balance his skills and make sure to improve on the areas that he was deficient in to make him a more capable and efficient shinobi. They however also witnessed the one time that he had loosened the seal and allowed Naruto to reach the fourth-tailed state of Kurama's chakra in an attempt to allow Naruto to somehow control the chakra of Kurama more openly. Though it did not work out the way the man hoped as Naruto lost control as Kurama was quick to take advantage of the loosening of the seal, nearly killing him though he sealed it again and told Naruto that he must find another means to be stronger than his overt reliance on Kurama's still hate-filled chakra. They also witnessed his return to Konoha was shown along with reuniting with Sakura as well as Kakashi in his second bell test alongside Sakura against Kakashi. Here he showed his growth as a ninja and his increased combat skills as well. They also witnessed the beginning rescue mission to save Gara, who had been attacked by Akatsuki members Didera and Sasori was soon seen. There they would see how Naruto revealed to both Sakura and Tamari that he was a Jinchuriki like Gara. Answering the two's question on why Naruto took the kidnapping of Gara by Akatsuki so seriously, and Naruto soon met none other than Chio, who carried an axe to grind towards Kakashi's father due to a long ago loss of her son to Kakashi's father, and she was the one who, under the orders of Gara's own father, the fourth case cage to turn Gara into a Jinchuriki. This was something that angered Naruto, but he placed that aside as he had to save Gara. However, apart from Sasori and Didera, Itachi and Kisame were in the field and they were aided by Gai and his team of Neji. Tenten, and Rock Lee. The Amazons were somewhat impressed but also disgusted by Sasori's transformation from a human to a living doll of war willingly in the way Didera used his explosive clay in battle along with his blatant disregard for life. And they witnessed how despite his most valiant attempts, Naruto was unable to save his friend Gara, 
a fellow Jinchuriki and who had once been his enemy until he knew that he was like him, he had been proud and somewhat annoyed that Gara became a cage before him, but had great faith in him, and was utterly enraged and despondent that he had not made it in time as Gara's biju, the shukaku was extracted from him, leading to his death. And how he violently decried the life Chio gave Gara by making him a Jinchuriki, demanding what right she and others had to call them monsters when they were the real monsters. The Amazons witnessed the angry and emotional exchange between Naruto and the elder woman Chio, and it was clear that Naruto's emotions were very much open to them to see. Calm down, Naruto Uzumaki, shut up, you kami forsaken San Shinobi did this to him. You used him like he was just a weapon. If you hadn't put that thing into him none of this would have happened to him. What right do you people have to do this to Gaara? To use him like this as if you were kami and judge him nothing more than a tool? In his emotional state Naruto lost some of his energy when he had been shouting at the elderly woman but that hardly meant that it was over as what the Amazons could see. Jinchuriki. What right do you people have to call us monsters? You think you have the right to stand there and use us like we are tools? Like we're nothing but weapons? Damn you, and all like you. What gives you the right to think or better than us? You have no idea what it feels like to carry the burden like me and Gara. We're monsters? We deserve to die? We're mistakes? From where I stand, you are the monsters. Normally the idea of an elderly woman being shouted at like that would offend the Amazons greatly. But after learning that it was indeed Chio who turned Gara into what he was prior to his friendship with Naruto, they could not help but understand Naruto's rage towards her. Even Hippolyta felt anger at the idea of woman willing turning a child into a living weapon in such a manner even if it was under the others of their leader, the fact that the leader was Gara's own father angered her immensely. Naruto himself recalled his own emotional state back then and managed to relax himself, he knew what happened in the end, that hardly meant that it had less of an effect on him though. They saw how in repentance she gave her life to bring Gara back, with Naruto providing his own chakra to aid in it though at the time he had no idea that the technique would end with Gara alive and Chiyo dead, and how she in her final moments spoke that perhaps under men like him and Gara, Suna and Konoha would be able to have a bright future from all the mistakes the elders made. Place, your hands on top of mine, you, are indeed unique, Naruto Uzumaki, in this world of ninja, created by, old people who have such frivolous desires, and worse, it is, truly wonderful to see that such new souls like you can come into this world. Up to now, all I have done, in my life has been wrong, but, finally in my last moments, I can finally do something right, the future of Suna, and Konoha, will be far brighter with people like you, and Gara, far better than the mess it was in our time, a mess, old fools like me made because of our desires and thoughts. The last conversation between Chio and Naruto after she spoke to Sakura was for him to look after Gara, and it was here that Tamari, Konkuru and the other San Ninja arrived and were cheering for Gara's resurrection, but were also saddened that in exchange for doing this, Chio herself died. She died saving Gara. Naruto looked to see Philippus asking the question and he responded in kind. Yeah, at first I thought she was going to do something to him but after I learned the truth I realized that despite what I thought, there was a good person underneath the aged cynic that was before me. She was entrusting me and Gara the future of our villages so we, in turn our generation will learn from the mistakes of the older ones and even our own I guess at the time, and in the end we proved her right. This was something that had an effect on some of the Amazons. Namely Hippolyta as she had not forgotten what she had learned of Gara's life of being turned into a Jinchuriki. And how like Naruto was treated as a monster but had never been able to find others until much later in life. It was in a sense Naruto who helped him awaken from his own personal hell and become the leader of his own hidden village and change the views of others when it concerned him, thus it was a good thing to see that in the end, Gara learned he was never truly alone, after the funeral and their plan to return back to Konoha, they witnessed Gara and Naruto shake hands and though no longer a Jinchuriki. His meeting with Sai which was hardly one would consider cordial due to Sai being a follower of Danzo and his calling of Sasuke as a traitor. Though in hindsight, one could not fault say words due to the actions of Sasuke recently. And the mission to meet Sasori's spy using the salvaged puppet used by the now confirmed slain Akatsuki member as cover for Yamato. Only for the spy to be Kabuto himself, it was also not long before it was revealed that both Kabuto and Orochimaru had planned to slay Sasori and were a bit surprised to see that instead of the former Suna Shinobi. It was the Konoha ninja, even more so to see Sai, Sakura and Naruto with them, however. This was where things went downhill as Orochimaru decided to goad Naruto and suicided as Naruto awakened the two-tailed state in the same manner as when he faced Tidera, but this quickly escalated to the three-tailed state, even though the images were from his memories, the power that was imbued in the memories filtered through to be felt by the Amazons. By Hera, Hippolyta spoke as the power she felt flowed through the room due to the memories Naruto had, 
and the power was vile and evil indeed and to know that somehow the young man before her in his past life held such dark power was rather disconcerting, however she kept in mind that the power he was using was from the time that his biju partner Karama hated humans. The same sentiment was in both Diana and Donna as well while they watched the battle play out. And it was not long before Naruto's memories showed his transforming into the four-tailed state when he faced Orochimaru again and the renegade Sanin taunted him when it concerned Sasuke only added fuel to the fire. The sight of what Naruto could unleash in such a state was shocking to the Amazons and some of them looked at him warily. Something he expected considering what they knew of him already. It was nearing the end of the fight that Yamato, using his powers in the necklace saved Naruto from his berserker state when he accidentally injured Sakura. The Amazons also witnessed the revelation of Sei mission concerning Sasuke and after they infiltrated the base, they finally had the meeting with Sasuke in the aftermath when Sasuke showed that just like them, he had indeed grown stronger, thus he knew that he needed to ramp up his own abilities further, sadly though, Jiraiya had a matter of his own deal with, but he replied that this was the right time for Kakashi to do his part in training him. His training to master his wind element to curb his use of Karama's powers as well as other jutsu to help him in battle was soon shown to them as he worked with Kakashi and Yamato. Here it was Kakashi who showed Naruto his affinity and how it could be fused with the Rasengan to increase its power and the hidden secret of the Cage Bunshin. The training was difficult and certainly not something that could be done even with the Cage Bunshin easily, namely since Kurama would routinely try to hijack the Cage Bunshin, thus Yamato was nearby to restrain the Biju when that happened, it was when he met fellow wind user Asuma Serutobi did he improve his training in the use of his element using what the man told him when it concerned the use of wind. The battle with the Akatsuki zombie duo Hidan and Kakuzu Hover cut his training short as he moved to assist them. But that same battle was where he would cement himself into the hero he would become and it was here where they would see his use of the Rosenshuriken in the first stage of its creation. Helping end the threat of the zombie duo and avenging the death of the one who taught him how to utilize his wind chakra, Jonin Asuma Serutobi, but hearing that the Rosenshuriken was actually damaging Naruto at the same time was disconcerting despite the destructive power it had so he needed to find a way to overcome this stumbling block or learn another method of combat in new jutsu. This was soon followed by his encounter with Isobu as well as Gurren once he had fully recovered from the effects of his injuries and learning collaboration jutsu from Jiraiya before Jiraiya would lose his life in battle with Nagato and Konan. The battles between his combined team and the crystal user and her own unit was a bit of an eye-opener to the Amazons. Namely to see how Naruto soon managed to change a once loyal follower of Orochimaru to being someone who showed compassion and a desire to redeem herself for taking the life of the mother of the child she now saw as someone she would risk her very life to save. Of course along the way the Amazons also saw through the effects of the mist Isobu used, Naruto's still lingering issues, namely dealing with trying to still find and redeem Sasuke and stop him from becoming lost into the darkness, in the end however, not only had they been able to save the young man Yukimaru but helped Gurin, Yukimaru, and Gozu escape and eventually find their own path in life. Though Naruto would later learn that the Anbu who were doing the sealing were slain by Didera and Obito and thus explained Isobu's capture. These various events in the eyes of the Amazons would shape this man and it was clear that Naruto was taking in those memories well himself, and it seemed to be helping in some way towards his own situation, that was possible since he seemed to be more, whole looking at the memories before him. The pursuit of Itachi which fails as he was prevented by Obito was soon though it seemed that the meeting resulted in a conversation of importance, however, the Amazons were disgusted when one of the crows used by Itachi, actually dove into his mouth and he was forced to swallow it, Philippus was the one who spoke on that with an abject look of disgust on her face. What in the name of Hera was that? Naruto just knew that this was going to be hard to explain. Let's just say, that disgusting events aside, that would come in handy, but rest assured, I don't have that bird in me anymore and keep in mind you are only seeing the events from my memories, I had to be the to swallow it, no one else so if it was disgusting for you, imagine how it felt for me. This was soon followed by him meeting Kabuto again. And the near recovery of Sasuke had it not been for interference from Obito. In the end they were delayed long enough for Sasuke to finally kill Itachi and in the end the trail went cold much to Naruto's frustration. But it was not long however that a new mission came up and this had to focus on him dealing with fellow Biju and Jinchuriki Saiken and Yutakata along with Hotaru who to the disgust of the Amazons had carried in her a powerful Kinjutsu weapon that could be amounted to a massive fireball of equally massive destructive potential. They were shocked that Hotaru willingly accepted the Kinjutsu to save her clan from destruction and it was revealed that only her grandfather could safely extract the Kinjutsu from her. Her initial refusal was hard to swallow until Yutakata convinced her that saving her clan with such a destructive weapon was a disaster in the making, sadly the one who could extract the Kinjutsu was the leader of the bandits who had attacked Hotaru in the first place. 
In the end despite the activation of the jutsu and the potential death of Hotaru it had been prevented by both Jinchuriki and Hotaru was free of the Kinjutsu and Yutakata decides to finally be Hotaru's sensei. Sadly before it could happen Yutakata was captured and defeated by Pain himself and could not be there for Hotaru in the end and died when Saiken was taken from him. Naruto eventually revealed to the Amazons that Hotaru was heartbroken after the ward but remained strong for Yutakata's sake and eventually found a master to train her and soon bring her clan back slowly from extinction. The end of that mission was merely the beginning for Naruto's path in life as he now had to undertake the training to master Sage Mode after his sadness to learn the death of Jiraiya at the hands of Pain, Nagato once he returned to Konoha. Apparently Jiraiya had taken a high-risk mission into a Megacure as it had been rumored to be the HQ of the leaders of Akatsuki, it turned out the information was right, but it had gotten Jiraiya killed as he heard it from the one Naruto explained to be Pa Toad. They saw how angry and despondent the blonde was at the news of Jiraiya's death and even raged against Tsunade for sending Jiraiya on a suicide mission such as that. And how it had nearly resulted in him going after Pain himself even though at the time he was told that as he was, he would be killed, they watched as he was seemingly drained of the will to fight how he had recalled the good times he had with the man, minus the headaches he had trying to keep the man from raiding his wallet and being a pervert to be sure. Still they saw that it was Shikamaru who reminded him of the duty they all had and his own promise to his own deceased sensei, he had a duty to Jiraiya to make the perverted ninja's belief in peace a reality so he must not stay here forever, it and seeing his village and recalling everything he had accomplished thus far that allowed the blonde to regain his fighting spirit, thus he went to train on Mount Myobokuzen alongside the two toads who trained Jiraiya in the use of Senjutsu. Hippolyta soon spoke as she was curious of this Senjutsu, and despite seeing a number of times now, the sight of these sentient and sapient toads was still interesting since if it had not been for the clothes, hair, and actions, they would have easily passed for ordinary animals. What was this senjutsu that you had to learn with these toad summons? Naruto decided to explain some of the details of senjutsu. And naturally the idea of summoning the energy of the natural world into Oni's self to gain a great deal of power into one's self was interesting to the Amazons. Naturally he explained that this could not be done for them since in order to learn Senjutsu one had to learn from those who were highly attuned with nature. And he learned it in Mount Myobokuzen and from the toads who called it home. Which meant it was Gamabunta's home too, he also mentioned the high risk of learning it and getting the control and chakra ratios wrong, namely seeing the toad statues and how former students of the Senjutsu arts among the toads died as humans and were turned into toads of considerable size and were now pure stone. Seeing the sheer number of the statues gave the Amazons a very accurate idea how difficult the training truly was. They also saw through risk Naruto had to take since there had been a number of occasions that he was turning into a toad in the training with the oil. However, they did find it somewhat humorous when they saw the male toad sage using the cane to whack the natural energy out of Naruto when he was losing it, and it happened a lot of times too, Naruto's reactions to being turned into a pinata were amusing to them. The same could not be said for Naruto who gave a groan of annoyance at the memory of that event. Geez, this I remember, and not with that much fondness. That however was topped when he was showing the memories of him eating the food of the toads, which were naturally grubs, caterpillars, moths, and all manner of insects, while the women here were hardly squeamish, the idea of eating those did not exactly sit well with them, they looked at Naruto who sighed in regards to the fact that he was eating them. Okay, yes it is disgusting, but some things have to be made clear, one, it was the only food they had, two, it would be rude for me to turn them down since they are my trainers, and three, you have to keep in mind you're just looking at the memories I had, I am the one who ate them, remember? They had to give him that, and soon they witnessed him successfully master sage mode. Though he had to find a solution of his own when he could not sync with Ma or Pa Toad due to Karama being around. As his training continued, it was not long however that he was informed that Konoha was under attack. And not by regular forces either, but Akatsuki itself. They had finally come to take him and this time, it was the pair of Nagato and Konan who led the assault, by the time he arrived, the village had been decimated, a massive crater was there and a large number of ninja and civilians had been badly injured and others, including Kakashi, and Shizun had been killed, Naruto managed to save Tsunade in time by smashing his massive Rasengan on the attacking Pain body and now was ready to settle accounts with the man before him. His battle with Pain, Nagato after Konoha is flattened by the man was one of the most interesting battles they had ever seen since he had made very intelligent use of his abilities. Even more so when he unleashed the now fully completed Rosenshuriken into battle. Unlike the first version that was for close combat and more like a double-edged sword. This new variant was throw able and could expand rapidly and sliced anything in its reach into literal slivers, the technique was quite, impressive by the standards of the Amazons and its deadly effects were not the least bit lost on his foes, however, even though he had overcome the limitations of Senjutsu his way, 
he still had to deal with the fact that he was fighting someone with the Rinnegan and had several others like him with the same set of eyes. His reaction to the supposed death of Hanada and the loss of Kakashi. Many of his fellow ninja and friends, and Fukasaku and how he was nearly forced to unleash Kurama until his father came to stop him. Naruto was confused at first until he realized that the fourth was his father. Their meeting did not start well as Naruto punched his father. Demanding why he had Kurama inside of him as IoT had made his life hell and why as a father he did that to him. In answer to that, Minato revealed that he had not done so lightly and did so in order to face the masked man who was in truth the one who had been the cause of the release of Kurama. Since at the time neither Minato nor Naruto knew it to be Obito, he also had faith that his son with Kashina would be able to handle the burden he placed on him for if not he would have done otherwise, and told Naruto that he had faith he could end the cycle of hatred that was the root cause of so many deaths even that of his sensei and Naruto's godfather. It was this faith placed on him by his father even when he doubted he could do it, that give him the courage and the will to fight and how he would eventually defeat pain and end the cycle after his father reinforced the seal, he soon faced pain, Nagato and despite Nagato's attempts to control him, Naruto could not be cowed but instead of attacking Nagato, even if his hatred and anger demanded to be satisfied, he decided to hear Nagato out. The Amazons watched the scene play out between Naruto and Nagato as well as Conan as the two former students of the same master faced one another as Nagato told the blonde of his own history and how he knew of Jiraiya and what led to his fall. Namely the interference of Danzo and his root Anbu. The speech between the two on how peace could be achieved was surprising. Even more so when they saw Naruto stating that even if he could never forgive Nagato for slaying Jiraiya. His sensei Kakashi and causing so much death, he would not kill him for the sake of the future and because it would only allow the cycle to continue with no true end in sight. It was, impressive to their eyes, some not so much but all could not help but be deep in witnessing the results as Nagato, using what life and power he had left had brought the souls of all the people he and his forces had slain back to life, all because of what he felt Naruto represented, a future that would indeed bring an end to the pain, misery and more that had claimed so many lives, including his own family and in effect Yahiko as well. They also heard his last words on what hatred truly was and what it did to people, and that hatred and war are merely two parts of the same dark coin, that was the true enemy Naruto had to defeat if he wanted to make Jiraiya's dream and that of the sage come true, but he had faith that his fellow student would indeed make it happen, that the cycle of hatred and more would end. Interesting, Philippus commented as she looked at the result, when it seemed that only tragedy and death would reign at the aftermath, those who died were brought back from the dead, by the life of the very same man who killed them from before. Diana was odd as well, seeing as how Naruto despite the anger and grief he felt had managed to accomplish this through words alone, it took a great deal of mental will and spirit to do that and it was something that she had to admire. Artemis was in some ways impressed by the battle as she, despite her still present dislike for men had to admire the fighting style. Tenacity and adaptability the blonde displayed against such a unique and undeniably deadly foe, Artemis had absolute confidence in herself as an Amazon, pride as well, but even she had to admit that fighting someone of pain, Nagato's powers and undeniable talent and powers was a risky situation, she was not the only Amazon to think that as Philippus, Hippolyta, and Diana were also of the same mind having witnessed the battle from start to finish. The end result of the battle was seen as Conan took the bodies of Nagato and Yahiko in coffins made of paper and giving a bouquet of flowers made from paper, there she promised that she as well as AIM were through with Akatsuki and that she along with they were allies of Naruto now and they would stand with him, he now carried the dream of Yahiko, Nagato, and Jiraiya for a new and peaceful world and she would fight to make sure that the dream became a reality. The Amazons witnessed how the villagers had changed their views of Naruto as they now considered him a hero for what he had done. Even to the point of considering him Hokage material, a vast change from what they had done in the past, they saw the cheers given by the people of Konoha none more louder than the families who had before lost their sons, daughters, husbands, mothers, wives, uncles, and aunts, the same could be said for the cheers and smiles given by Naruto's friends and allies, and there on the faces of Aruka and Kakashi was pride and respect for what Naruto had done. It was indeed a great change to the time when many of these same people used to insult the young man and to see it happen was something that had to be respected in their society, even more so when they saw that it was genuine. It was not long however that the news came to Konoha of the capture of Killer B. The adopted brother of the Rakage, A, and who was also a Jinchuriki like Naruto. The leader of Kumogakur, a took great offense to the kidnapping as it followed the loss of another Jinchuriki.